But I'm an old dog and there's new tricks And some of my opinions you just can't fix Cause I'm an old man yelling at the sky I'ma shake my fist at the clouds and cry Get up my lawn, you snowflake Before I have a meltdown, breakdown, shakedown Cause this is my hometown, so back down Sports clown, it's all just a game And it's a last down, let down, cow town I said it's all just a game I give the touchdown, the run down, the low down Cause it's all just a game Gonna crack down, and shut down, the sun down I said, uh, I said, uh, I said it's all just a game Not a hell of a lot that I would put up against anybody, but I put that theme song about uh, who else? Give me a name. I want a name. Nobody. Nobody has their own theme song quite the way we have right here on Just a Game. Um, you know what? We're a, a three man operation today. Welcome to the show, RJ. Uh, he's he's joining our crew, which is cool. Um, and I'm currently booking our Monday show. We're we're in the middle of starting Friday show. But I'm just going to tell Brent Cron right now that we'll do 115 on Monday, Croner in studio. So uh, lock up your daughters. Uh, perhaps if you have old people in the house, you may want to sedate them. Brent Cron will be on the podcast on Monday in the early slot. Uh, hopefully, we'll get uh, Pike back too because Pike was traveling. That we didn't even we didn't even admit to that, nor did we even talk about that. But Ryan Pike uh, chose to take a vacation for some reason beyond unbeknownst to us anyway i believe he was in sin city so uh we'll ask him about you know well though what happens in vegas stays in vegas happy happy friday to you happy june to you our first who knew we would get from february all the way to june certainly not me but here we are um looking forward to what lays ahead in this month with the nhl entry draft uh free agency will start all kinds of things and oh yeah by the way at some point we will play the stanley cup final uh, at least that's that's what I'm hearing. A um, couple of important months uh, as an ally for uh, the LBGTQ community. Uh, it uh, is Pride Month. So, uh, of course, this is a inclusive program. Everybody is welcome. You are all loved here and welcomed here. Um, even, you know, even you guys on the Internet that I talk about every once in a while. We love you. Uh, as well, it's Aboriginal um, Awareness Month and uh, wish to salute. Um, our friends uh, at, at six, six, Satina, Morley Pekane. Um, we are thinking about our, our brothers and sisters in the blood tribe right now. Um, we've got some nasty issues up North with some of our other treaties with fires and things like that. So certainly want to uh, make sure that we're uh, recognizing them in their time. Um, okay. Well, let's talk about it. Shall we? Um, what the hell? Like, the Stanley Cup final starts tomorrow. I don't normally do this. Like, I'm going to watch because that's what I do. Um, but this is for you guys. This is me getting on the soapbox and getting angry for you guys. Give me a freaking break. Give me a break. Ten days. Ten days for Florida. Uh, you know, now, the nice thing is Bobrovsky likes a break between games. He's going to get a break between games, clearly. Uh, and Vegas has been, you know, off for the better part of a week now. I get it. I understand it. It's our television overlords. Um, I do find it um, somewhat baffling, confusing, frustrating, but almost relieving in a way that after two decades, we're still referring to our television overlords. Um, you get you get the rights. You get to pick and choose. Goes back to that. Remember the first round when we were all real angry about having to stay up late on a Sunday to watch Edmonton in L.A.? Same thing. Same thing. Television chooses. Now, uh, you would think the Canadian rights holder would have more to say in this than the American rights holder, but you would be wrong about that. Um, of course, this is decisions made um, by people much smarter than me. But at some point, at some point, you've got to do something to kind of get going here and not lose people's attention. The NBA finals are on now. Um, 
it's summer. I It's not yesterday, but the rest of the time it's been summer, all of those sort of things. Um, you're dragging your heels. You're proving, like you want to prove that hockey will work into late June. Enough is enough. Come on. Enough is enough. <sighs> oh, hey, did you guys hear about this? This is fantastic. Uh, and if you've watched any of the other uh, Nation Network shows or the Flames Nation shows, you'll know that we are a huge part of this. The UFC back right here. Not here in Calgary like we thought it was going to be six weeks ago. No, no, but in Vancouver. UFC 289, Nunez and Eldana, and that is going to take place next Saturday. Not, not today, next Saturday. It's the first time that the UFC has been in Canada in four years. It's in Vancouver, UFC 289, Nunez and Eldana at Vancouver's Rogers Arena next Saturday, June 10th. Um, looking forward to this highly anticipated Women's Bantam Lightweight Championship between the legendary Amanda Nunez and number five ranked contender Irene Aldana. Pay-per-view, your uh, local UFC supporting watering hole, however you need to take it in, take it in, because you're not going to want to miss this card. As I understand it, and I'm certainly no expert in this, six Canadians on the card. So a Maple Leaf bonanza next Saturday. Looking forward to that. Uh, when last we spoke, which was on Wednesday, uh, we were talking about a potential new general manager in Toronto who would be a familiar face, and he is indeed a familiar face, as yesterday Brad True Living was introduced as the 18th general manager in Toronto Maple Leafs history. Uh, he spoke to the media. Um, he spoke exactly as we expected Tree to speak speak to the media. Uh, he was self-deprecating. He had a little fun at his former captain's ex his expense, Mark Giordano. Um, he basically captivated the crowd. Uh, didn't bother me a bit. Uh, some in Toronto a little irked, irked, I believe is the word, because uh, the Penguins announced just half hour before Tree Living's press conference that Kyle Dubas wasn't going to be their general manager. No, no, going to be their president of hockey operations, interim general manager as well, but president of hockey operations. Um, texted a little bit with uh, Brad and just congratulated him. And, uh, you know, you heard him in the, uh, if you listen to the conference uh, call or the uh, press conference, and, and he reiterated the same thing. Um, by the way, look at that. Oh, we'll get to that in a second. I want to get to that in a second. Uh, but Brad reiterating um, his love and his time here in Calgary and the people in Calgary and really appreciated it. And I did too. I mean, he was always the first guy to say yes when I would ask him about helping in the community or coming to a, a coaching conference or Berkey's Targets for Kids. He was always there. So really excited. Now, I, I like this because Brad is a really interesting dude. If you got to know him, like his story is is pretty pretty cool uh, because he was a former Brandon Wee King and he did try try to make his way in professional hockey. Uh, he did try out with the uh, the Vancouver Canucks. There's if, if you ever get uh, Berkey and and Tree in the same room, they tell a great story about Berkey cutting uh, Brad for living. But he was in the ECHL, and if we can put up this graphic, this was really cool. When he was with the ECHL, um, he became the guy that uh, got the players there unionized. So they became part of the PWHA as IHL players, American Hockey League players um, were uh, already part of that group. He got the ECHL players and he got them into the same group. So it's pretty cool. Uh, he would go on there to leave as a player and start the Western Professional Hockey League, or if you're in the loop, uh, and I didn't know this until way after the Whipple, uh, the Western Professional Hockey League, which had a predominant amount of teams in Texas as well, um, you know, into Louisiana and some other places. He'd go on to be the commissioner of the central, the old Central Hockey League, and then moved on to his time in Arizona. Great stories from from Brad about um, the way that he conducted himself in his business. Um, you're talking about the Central Hockey League and the Whipple. The commissioner would be stringing the nets uh, prior to the first game because the staff didn't know how to do it. Uh, many mascot incidents and issues that he had to deal with. So, uh, and also, um, and I don't know if, if this one's public, so I might be talking a little out of turn. Uh, but uh, Brad got a real 
uh, especially in Texas, got a real introduction into how things work at the city council level. Um, that you know you should grease the wheels ahead of time, and uh, he he has some great stories. This is a long way for me to say what a great great journey he's been on, and it ends up as the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And whether we like it or not, Peter Marr and I talked about this. We'll talk about it with Eric DeHatchuk in a little while. Um, whether we like it out west or not, it's a big deal in the most populated part of this country. And I told this story a couple of weeks ago about uh, Jay Feaster saying it and Craig Conroy believing it and Brad for Living's out of this. <laughs> you want to be the guy that brings the Stanley Cup back to Canada. You do. And if you can bring it back to Toronto, they're going to print your face on money. So it's a real opportunity for Brad. I'm happy for him. Um, Mr. Conroy, let's deal with Mr. Conroy. Um, I know lots of people want to talk to him and lots of people have talked to him. And at some point we'd like to talk to him, but he is going great guns right now. Uh, combines coming up, pro meetings, the draft and everything. So my expectation and my ask will be sometime probably after free agency, uh, just cause then there'll be lots to talk about. Um, busy, busy guy to say the least. Um, just a couple other notes, uh, in the hockey world, uh, for you poolies, this is the best I can do when it comes to the gambling kids, uh, for you poolies. Uh, Patrick Kane, four to six months, four to six months, had his hip resurfaced, I believe was the term, uh, and is expected to miss four or six months. Don't know who he's playing for uh, quite yet because uh, he's a free agent. But if you're counting on Pat, now Patrick Kane says he wants to play for a long, long time. He just won't play for four to six months. Preseason CFL action last night. Uh, BC put the boots to Calgary in the first half. Calgary put the boots to BC in the second half. And what happens? Well, it's a three-point game. BC 25, Calgary 22. We move on to the regular season now. First game of the NBA final. Uh, Denver 104 over uh, Miami at 93. Uh, Denver taking the one game to none lead. Um, boy, I like sitting back and watching people bitch at each other. Uh, when you're not in the middle of it, you have no horse in the race. This whole uh, why is Denver in the final, Miami in the final, as opposed to LeBron and the Lakers in the final stuff is fascinating to me. Uh, but it's a good game. I don't know if you watch much of it. Good game. Oh, and hey, by the way, who knew? Toronto won yesterday. Uh, the uh, Blue Jays three and one, uh, three one over Milwaukee. They're now thirty and twenty seven. Yes, 30 and 27. You remember when we were all talking about, oh, this Blue Jays team is different. Oh, oh, oh Alex Manoa at the top of the rotation, and this team is going to be different. This team is exactly the same again. So we will see lots of time. Uh, my expectation is that uh, with the trade deadline, that, believe it or not, we're already having those trade deadline conversations. The trade deadline about six weeks away, maybe a little less than that. Uh, you would expect that the uh, the Blue Jays are going to be very active to try and get their a their pitching. It's not their whole starter. I mean, there's some good there's some good stories in their start starters, uh, but they've got to become more consistent. They got to play like the team they keep telling us they are. All right, is that no, 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 no. okay? We talked about True Living. We talked about Dubis. Um, yeah, and then yeah, it's completely uh, lunacy that uh, we have to wait until Saturday for a Stanley Cup game. None of my bitching and moaning is going to change a damn thing. You know that. And I will be here probably next year. Well, if I'm here next year, it's a bit of a minor miracle. But if I'm here next year, you can be sure that I'll be bitching and moaning about the same thing because I have been bitching and moaning about our television overlords for many, many years. Don't get me started because I'll go down that path. <sighs> okay, I'm not sure what we're about to do. I'm really not. Um, in the past, we have prided ourselves in innovation and doing things that nobody else does and being the first. I do find it rather interesting that uh, somebody around here is, hey, the Flames, we're looking for a GM. Why don't you do your GM plans? Really? Hmm. Wonder where you got that idea from. Anyway, we like to do things a little. I have always appreciated that I don't, I'm not the be all end all. I am nothing. I'm just the guy that tells you what he thinks and adds to the conversation, hopefully informs you, brings on people you want to hear from. But ultimately, at the end of the day, in this whole giant circle, this ecosystem we call professional sports and hockey, I am but just mere organisms floating out here. The most important, the heartbeat 
the heartbeat has always been the fan. So the nice thing about Sports Talk Radio was we used to be able to do uh, uh, phone calls, take calls after games and stuff. And it was, you know, really good. And, and then it wasn't. Um, it used to be real nice. And, and then it wasn't. Um, you know, things change. Things evolve. Social media has certainly impacted that. What is the role of the fan? Where's the role of the fan, the voice of the fan? I mean, it's easy for me to say, well, I am the voice. I am not the voice of the fan. So I was thinking about this when we came back. And I, I gave it a lot of thought. And I thought, you know, we're, we're going about this the wrong way. Like we bring in all the other organisms in the ecosystem and we ask them. But the only organism we don't ever seem to bring in is the person who's probably the most, not probably, is at the center of all this. Without fans, without ticket buyers, without merchandise buyers, without consumers of the product, without people who read, without people who tweet, without people who buy jerseys, without people who care, who talk about it in sports bars, who move it forward, who watch or listen to this podcast, we are nothing and we do not exist. So in difference to that, I am going to throw caution to the wind because he's brought me notes. Like who brings the host notes? That's the first place we're starting. But our next guest brought to you by Ski Seller Snowboard, skisellersnowboard.com, 76 years in Calgary, uh, four locations during the winter, one location in the summer. That's important. One location in the summer, McLeod Trail by Chinook Center, skisellersnowboard.com. It is indeed my pleasure to represent a gentleman that I got to know over the last decade or so, who is a flame season ticket holder, a fan of all of our sports teams here in Calgary, and he speaks rather good. So I thought that that would, that would be a nice reason to bring him in. Anthony Cox joins us here this afternoon. Don't make the mistake that I made and call him Tony. No, no, don't do that because <laughs> I did that once. Mr. Cox, good afternoon to you, sir, and thank you for agreeing to do this. Thanks, Rob. It's nice to see you. It's nice to be seen. Uh, the microphone will move, so I don't want you to get like your back crooked. Or, no, no, no. Take it with you. I'm saying you don't have to lean in if you don't want to. Thank you. It's fully adjustable. How are you? I'm well. Okay. I'm well. Can I? Because you are the first person who's ever done this. I've never been handed notes by a guest before. In fairness, Rob. Yeah. I've listened to the program. No. Okay. <laughs> Anthony is a lawyer who practices in the areas of labor and employment law and corporate and commercial law. This I know to be true. This I know to be true. Friend of the program. That too, I know to be true. Um, I, at, <laughs> okay, I was going to say this on my own. I have in the past consulted with my dear friend, Mr. Cox on issues involving sport and the law, because I thought it was important to have the correct context, use the correct language and speak the right way about it. I think there's a tendency to create our own versions of the law and how law works and just kind of continue to uh you know go back and and all of that but is that is that i didn't read it the way consulted with anthony from time to time for his <laughs> professional perspective on topics business uh, business legal aspects of the nhl over the years which is absolutely true a hundred percent that is absolutely true um and 25 years is a flame 25 last year 25 coming up uh just booked uh season 25 this is just, this is season 25. Only 25, so I'm the new guy. No, no, I, you are not the new guy. Okay, how are you, by the way? I'm I'm really good. Okay, I'm thank you for doing this. I mean, it's a lot of fun and all, all the hot air and everything like that. Because I want to <laughs> give you the, the full radio experience. But I do appreciate you doing this. And it was, from day one, my intention to bring you on. Because um, we've always had good conversations. You're very challenging. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. You, why are you laughing? I don't, no, no, no. But. Part of what I, you know, you've heard me say this all the time. The biggest uh, compliment that I can get paid, I feel, is you made me think. Not, oh, I agree with everything you say. And never have you said, I agree with everything you say. Never. Not once. It'd be nice if you did, but never. Never, not once. Um, and I do like that. I like that you can't be baffled with bullshit. Oh, Ty, sorry about that. Um, I enjoy it. I, it's a good repertoire. So I, uh, you were the guy that I wanted to bring on because again, reading somebody's 
you know, comment or text or tweet, they all have value, but it's not the same as the, you know, being able to sit down and look somebody in the eyes and go, okay, what do you really mean by that? So that's why we're doing this exercise. So thank you to, for agreeing to it because you are doing it a little bit on blind faith. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I'm happy yeah, to be here. Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> it does feel a little bit like a trial. Okay. Tell me about 2223. We'll get to the other 23 previous seasons, but tell me about this last season from your perspective as a Flames fan. You know, it was uh, an interesting fan fan perspective to develop over whatever seven months that we played. Um, the things that I value, and I think many season ticket holders value, is an honest effort. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Everybody staying in their lane and doing their job. Mm -hmm. uh, there were times I saw that. There was a lot of times when I didn't. I'm not privy to everything that's going on inside the walls of the Saddle Dome Castle. So usually people do stuff for a reason, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're good reasons. Sometimes they're not good reasons. Sometimes they're selfish reasons. Sometimes they're team reasons. I didn't see a team that I think met potential. Everybody's got that same observation. That said, I think the team needed to score three more goals, mm -hmm. get three or four more points, mm -hmm. and none of this stuff is happening. None of the, the major... You think, you think it's that thin a razor? Or oh, I, like a line, eh? I'm absolutely convinced of that because, you know, you've heard the, the tropes that, you know, if they just won half of the overtime losses, they'd be a playoff team. And, you know, and as Daryl Sutter was always want to say, and, and it's proven to be absolutely true, despite my skepticism about that, just get in and see what happens. Well, and you, Peter Marr talked about it on Wednesday. This is the year that it, it's really come home to roost, right? With, you know, the team that is one point behind the flames in the standings in the Stanley Cup final. Exactly true. And, you know, for for my part, I thought the team was relatively well equipped. Mm -hmm. I thought the, the former general manager did a really good job of of rebounding on on the trampoline and getting back up to where <laughs> we needed to restock the okay, shelves. I like that a There's lot. There's a visual actually. of tree no, on, like, on, on, on a rebounder. Yeah, no, you know? I actually like that a lot. But he did that, and and uh, you know, I I think he did as well as he could with the hands he was dealt. You know, everybody's heard that. A lot of people have said that. I think it's whole, wholly true. My my concern though is that the dissection and vivisection of the team its management its coach that really started in earnest probably december january yep um i think it was premature i think it was emotional i think it was reactive and i said this when daryl left last time um i said it to ken king after mm -hmm. after daryl was relieved um because i had the privilege ken was a friend of mine for many years and and a very approachable, accessible, and and certainly driven individual. Yes. Um, take no prisoners. Check, 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 and check. Uh, be on my team or, <laughs> or yes. find something else to do. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think I, I think Daryl, when he left the first time, I think a good man was in the wrong role and, and was let go. Mm -hmm. I think this time, I think Daryl's overall, on balance, a decent human. I think he's an incredibly... Uh, knowledgeable hockey guy. Mm -hmm. I think he has a plan. Mm -hmm. I think he has a purpose, and I don't think he misspeaks or 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 makes mm -hmm. many mistakes. Mm -hmm. So when Daryl was let go uh, this time, I was frankly shocked, and that was a big nuclear thing for me. Really? Yeah, I was really surprised hmm. because. It makes me ask the question of what's going on inside the the walls of the saddle dome yep. that are so horrible that you know this is not a Bill Peter situation. Nope. This it's is a different situation. You know, absolutely. There's no kicking players, there's no changing the radio station, there's no, you know, identifying yep. differences over similarities. Yep. None of that that I'm aware of. Nope. And I would think that we have a small enough community that if it could be said, it would be said. Yeah. And the only reason it wasn't is because it couldn't be set. So for me, the Daryl thing was a big surprise. And I think it was a, a real opportunity for the organization to decide if they have a club, mm -hmm. if they have a team, mm -hmm. 
or if they have a program mm -hmm. and who's running said club team or program. Give me a little description when, because I, I think I understand, but it explained to me the difference between the three from your perspective. Well, I, th I think a club is, you know, you can go down to the ranchman's club so in downtown Calgary. You're talking like a country club. Country club. Okay. Yep. Okay. Where congratulations, welcome. Here's your Jersey. Here's your parking spot and here's your stall in, in, the, in the dressing sure. room. Yep. That's a club. It's fun. Yep. It's nice. I would suggest that maybe, you know, without getting into the trouble that other coaches have with disparaging the Arizona coyotes <laughs> or coyotes, as I like to call them, whatever you like, uh, <laughs> you know, I think that might be a, that might be a club. I think Columbus might be a club. I think a team is guys who generally on balance care about each other, work the same objective and kind of understand that mm -hmm. gratification may not be immediate or ever forthcoming. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a team. Um, I think Calgary was probably a team this year on some levels, but I think it was more of a club. Mm -hmm. and I think a program is more akin to uh, what these super high performing, high performing athletes do when they put a red maple leaf on their chest. Mm -hmm. That's a program. Would you look at the Tampa Bay Lightning as a program? 100%. Yeah, okay. 100%. They care more about, the cliche is, the the, the crest on the front than, the, than the, the name bar on the back. And that's a program. And and the thing that I didn't see this year was a lot of buy-in uh, on a consistent basis from from the broad team. That bugs, that, that, that bugs me. It's like, you know what? A player has their hands full doing their job being a super high performing ultra elite professional athlete who's paid for their trouble mm -hmm. to do so the to extend your job description into well i didn't like how he said that mm -hmm. i don't like how he accounted for you know jonathan huberdo being absent for a moment you know when R roberto Lu luongo took a bio break it was a great point of humor mm -hmm. and 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 uh everybody was cool with it mm -hmm. when daryl makes the crack it was not so much in my view and i don't know daryl but it was not in so much my view a critique of jonathan huberto as just take it easy guys it's it's a thing you know he's doing it and then apparently you know i do know a few people who know a few things and see things mm -hmm. better and differently than i do mm -hmm. and there's actually a lot of those mm -hmm. um Apparently that didn't go over well with, with, uh, with the roster. Mm -mm. Um, that was a problem. Mm -hmm. And I have to wonder about our sensitivities and our, our sensibilities. I think it's a problem. Like, what does it take to get you ruffled? Like a guy like, you know, Matthew Kachuk talking about your family on the ice and, mm -hmm. and things like that. You can live with that, mm -hmm. but you know, nature's calling is a hardship for these players and it derails them for not minutes not hours, not days, weeks and months mm -hmm. that leads to fundamental, you know, True. nuclear changes. So, so that's, that's, that's a thing. I, I would like to see, uh, the players respect, uh, their opportunity, um, to be in this league, to yep. do amazing things, yep. to recognize the competence and capabilities of, and potential of their teammates, right. uh, everywhere. Right. And when I watch team Canada play, I see. A red maple leaf go on the shirt. When's the last time you really saw Team Canada play? Um, in person? No, no, no. In 2014? Are you talking about any Team Canada? Or well, I've you seen talk a few. No, I've, no, 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 no. Yeah. I'm just making the point that we have not had best on best. Is uh, that the Team Canada you're talking about? Or are you talking about any national team? I think any time. Okay, sorry. I, I, think, thought you were, I thought you were talking about best on best. I think it's just a it's an outright privilege to be asked uh, to wear your flag and go perform as best you can internationally. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge thing. And I, I had heard that uh, one of the guys that I kind of enjoy as a player mm -hmm. uh, and a personality, Milan Lucic, mm -hmm. <laughs> wasn't on the, the first call sheet and he, he picked up the phone and said, well, hey, he was, no, he was not on their list. If there's a seat on the bus, I'll go. I'll do what I can. Whatever you need is yeah. probably what he said. But it was also a team that you would agree was made up of way too many American Hockey League players than what we're used to with that particular tournament. It's that used metal. to be... Oh, it's a gold medal, but that used to be a tournament that you got all uh, an entire NHL roster for, right? Fair enough, fair enough. But yeah. what what I no, saw, no, but I but I understand the point you're making is that that's the epitome of pulling the rope in the right direction. That's and, a program, yeah. 
uh, you know, notwithstanding the controversies and missteps yep. and catastrophes that we've seen with that national. No, team. but I, I, we all, we know the point you're making. Yes. So I, I'd like to see the Flames be a program. I'd like to see the guy who's you know making you know eight fifty a, a year, or the guy's making next year ten and a half. So let's let's stop there because I'll push back on you because I think you would you would agree that if you're going to have a program. You've got to have continuity and everybody on the same page. Yes. Correct. This team sat a young player for six games because the coach didn't want to play him. So is that continuity? Is that general manager and coach being on the same page? I think it was actually a really, we're talking about Mr. Pelt. Yep. Yep, okay, yep. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I think a bright young player. I think a couple things about that. I'm sure you're surprised. One is, I think that was an act of courage and generosity by the coach. I really do. Because when you're coming up, even if it's just from the locker room down the, down the hall, from, from, from the Wranglers, you don't really know what it's like. You haven't spent any time in there. And I think there has to be some environmental It happens hundreds of times in a year, Anthony. Doesn't happen well all the time. Doesn't always end well. And guys don't no, get but it. No, but I, give me another example of where that's happened and worked. Give me, give me another example of where somebody, I, I think you're misconstruing what happened. It's entirely possible. I, I, I help I, me out here. No, no, no. <laughs> to me, it was, it's, it's traditionally a coach who has a very specific, as a general manager, had a very specific view of how you develop players, right? And when they play. Right. But you're not the general manager anymore. You're the head coach. Was very specific to the media that it's not his job to develop players at the NHL level anymore. That ship has sailed. That is your job at the NHL level. You have to develop players. Sure. That was a point in which the general manager and the coach were not on the same page. So the general manager brings up the player and the coach sits him and eventually plays him. And guess what? He can play. I think I, I respect where you're coming from, but I don't think it's what you think it is. I don't know what conversations went on between Brad Living and Daryl Sutter. Nor, nor, and in I'm, fairness, I'm, nor do I. And nor do I. It could have very well been the organizational plan to say, you know what? I don't want you to make this guy a checker, a fourth liner. Jerome McGinley said when Conroy came over, we got plenty of checkers. Yeah, this guy has true. this guy yeah. has great talent. Yeah. We want him to be nurtured. Okay. We want him to be nourished. We want him to, to have an opportunity to understand, to make friends, to right. care about the people he's playing with and the people who play with him. Right. So I think that's that's a big part of it. Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. when when I, I did a little bit of sleuthing statistical no! analysis. Uh, as I find I often, this hard to believe. As I often hope that others will do, I read a book. <laughs> um, so what was really interesting to me is is when Peltier came up. Yep, he got a pretty good shot once he hit the ice. He, yes. he, he had he had many games. So was it twenty some games? Uh, I, off the top of my head, that sounds about correct. Twenty ish games. Yeah. So that's a pretty good look. Yeah. And then what happened? And I occasionally listen to media, which isn't the just a game podcast and what i was hearing from time to time was oh just play him why is lucic playing why is lewis playing blah yep. blah blah yeah so what's really yep. interesting to me is i did a little bit of statistical analysis on a performance basis of how jacob peltier did vis-a-vis -a, -vis a direct contrast with the often impugned milan lucic mm -hmm. so statistically they were fairly similar mm -hmm. in terms of their offensive production mm -hmm. in terms of their plus minus i think that Matthew or uh sorry I think that uh that Milan Lucic was actually superior in those regards mm -hmm. and I also think that that Milan Lucic and I'm gonna you know well you're gonna get hate mail about what I'm saying <laughs> um I care not uh as as do I yeah. not care but I think Milan Lucic brought something different to the team than Jacob Pelche could bring at that time and as far as the defensive game, he was equal to or better than Jacob Pelche for mm -hmm. that home stretch when Pelche wasn't playing and mm -hmm. there was hue and cry, mm -hmm. gnashing of teeth, clutching mm -hmm. of pearls. Mm -hmm. Do you hate young people? Mm -hmm. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that is not lost on me is Flames missed the playoffs by the thinnest of margins. Mm -hmm. And 
when you have to depend on a young guy versus a new guy mm -hmm. or, or versus an old guy, a veteran mm -hmm. who's going to bring grit, mm -hmm. who's going to, who's going to demonstrate that notwithstanding his foot speed or his, his softness of hands is going to bring you something which is reliability and intangibles and leadership. It's like, yeah, I don't skate very fast, but I try harder than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that you can't have a whole roster of those guys, no. but you do need somebody. But you had too much of that. Well, maybe you did. Maybe. Yeah. Did. But so my, my, my point, my point would be is, are you suggesting the flames missed the playoffs by the margin they did and not a greater margin by putting Lucic back into the lineup and playing him the rest of the year? You know, to me, at what point did you feel like, at what point were you disappointed that this team was not going to be what it was going to be? It was not at the end of the year. It was not game 82 where you go, oh, this shocked me. Um, I think it was the all-star break for a lot of people where they looked and said, you know, and they come out, they play the Rangers. They, they, they did that thing where they played like three games and they were fantastic, but found a way to lose, right? That's fantastic, but love, found a way to lose. There was a pattern there. There was a pattern there. There was a pattern there. And at the end of the day, I cannot dispute your numbers. They are there. They are, they are there. Someone will though. Rob. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> what I would dispute is, but ultimately, what's better? What's a better use of that ice time? Giving an older player who you're going to move on from, or possibly could be moving on from, or a younger player who you've invested in and need to develop. Well, I think I think people lose jobs when they miss the playoffs. I think people get histrionic, emotional, and and reactionary. Note, I we talked about this on Wednesday. I mean. I'll jump sports, but you know, the two guys that were in the 2021 NBA finals are now both out of jobs, right? Well, that's interesting. Cause I, I, not to interrupt. Am I interrupting you? No, that's not how podcast. I works. was, I, <laughs> thank you. I, I was thinking exactly the same thing. And I, I made a note for myself. Cause you I did really it. No, was. Yes. I, again, yep. you're the best I've ever seen. Oh, uh, well, you, <laughs> you should, come prepared more than any other guest. Get those eyes checked and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> but Part of my problem here is is that the the Flames didn't miss the playoffs because Milan Lucic played more or Jacob Pelche played less. That's got almost nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. I think this is just a talking point because everybody's really anxious about talking about. Well, I don't want to upset Jonathan Huberdo, and you know, because I understand. No, I'll talk. You want to talk about Jonathan Huberdo? Let's talk about Jonathan Huberdo. Do I? I absolutely detest his agent. And I'm not supposed to say that, and I don't know the man, and that my mom was going to slap me and wash my mouth out with soap when I get home. Should we say but, Alan Walsh so Alan he knows Walsh, exactly no, who we're was, talking no, about? No, I was going to get there. But Alan <laughs> Walsh does that same little move with his clients. Oh, how can they do this to my client? And then Jonathan Huberto comes out the next, oh, no, Alan, he didn't say, that wasn't me. Yeah. That think, wasn't me. I hate that. I, I also hate that. And yeah. I think I think that was your first uh uh, tell on the bent, if not the character, uh, of Jonathan Huberto and what he's bringing to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he's a sublimely talented individual. Mm -hmm. I think he's got terrific skills. I can tell you when I saw him passing to vacant spaces, uh, in all three zones in November, I thought, well, you know, he's kind yep. of figuring yep. out where his guys are and trying to bring his guys to where they need to be. Yeah. When I saw it in December, I thought, yeah, maybe he hasn't been out to dinner with these guys. When I saw it in March, yep. I'm I'm kind of losing my mind. Uh, I just don't like that. I think there's an intermittent work ethic. I think I think there's a prioritization of perhaps self over program. And that concerns the I, heck out of I me. don't disagree. I would say, though, the made it up for me was Mackenzie Weger is better than I thought he would be. I was happy right? to see that, you know, and it character gave, guy. Yeah. And it give we saw that, right. Character and I guess that it's interesting because, you know, to go a little further and to pull that thread a little bit more, hate, hated, 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 hated conversation about the coaching. And, and there isn't a coach here, but, oh, they should get Andrew Brunette because he coached him and they should get, if, if you're now to the point where you're bringing in a head coach based on one player, you're lost. This is this is exactly where I'm at, and this is my my talking point on club team program. Yeah, this is exactly the thing. So we when, still have to go back and deal with one more issue, but please continue. Not sure. on this part, but something you said earlier. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that when 
Alan Walsh comes like there's no accidents. Like you know what I no, do. For, I, I you know yeah, what I do. For I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. when when I go and represent or advocate for a client, yeah, I'm not going freestyle. I am actually talking to the client. I I rarely give clients what I call specific advice. What I do is I give clients options and consequences, and 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 then I advocate strictly, categorically vigorously on behalf of my client and their instructions and their interests yep. in that order. Yeah. And so when, when Alan Walsh says crazy stuff and then Jonathan Huberdeau gives the, Hey, what? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I think that's incredibly disingenuous yes. and false. Yes. And uh, I don't know. I it, wasn't it, there. No, but it plays us as dummies too. And I just want to change my wording. I don't detest Alan Walsh. I detest that maneuver. Agreed. How about that? Agreed. I don't know the man. I apologize to Alan and his family. It, it's not that I detest him. I just detest that maneuver. And it's, it, it insults my intelligence. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I didn't know. Mark andre Fleury. Oh, I didn't. if you didn't know, fire his ass because exactly what you just said, right? Yep. He's, not, he's not representing you the way you deserve to be represented. And you know what? The contract is signed. He's got his commission. There's, <laughs> you know, move, move on. So that for me was the first tell. And I thought, Okay, maybe that's just a guy who's new in town, not trying to upset anybody or anybody at, or anybody at all, mm. and just sort of shrug and giggle and carry mm. on. But I saw a whole bunch of that stuff. And and getting back to your point, is yep. we saw two champions bounce to the NBA finals. And I'm not the hugest follower, mm -hmm. certainly not a yep. reference guy for for NBA stuff. But it goes to my theory that you need a program and it needs to put team and crest over individuals and, and name bar. Have and, you heard a word about the job security of John Cooper? No, no, really not. Right. But in other markets, you would, geez, they, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. They won three. Yeah. Or they were there. Yeah. Four in a row. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. But this year they were out in six to Toronto. I've seen, and that to me is a really good example of what you're talking about. Tampa Bay lightning is fight club. Yes. Nobody talks Nobody about talks it. Nobody talks about You got it. a problem, you talk to, that, not that. about people. And I, we were talking about coaching, and this is one of the, the criticisms that I, I laid down on Daryl was not having a captain. I and, fully agree. Okay. And that's, one, one million percent. I think that, that was a big gap but for that, him. But just because of one thing doesn't – I want to get into that too. You, you're allowed to make mistakes, I think. But my point being is what I've always thought about John Cooper was – and look, they drafted Hedman, and they drafted Stamkos, and they drafted all of this character – but he uses them. He uses them. They're the delivery of the message, right? As that's, they should be. That's why you don't, that's why his message, you never hear anybody going, well, John Cooper's message is getting stale. It's not him delivering it. He's not the one that, he, he has the, the the enforcers that that do it for him. He's so got lieutenants. That's exactly Or lieutenants, as we would call well, them. As we would call them in Canada, yes. right? And, and, and I, I just... I wrote it down because I love your description of the club team and program because I think that's – and that has to be – to get to a program has to be Craig Conroy's number one job. And I know it is. I mean, he's aspirational to that. But if it's that easy, everybody would do it, right? You know, I, I think that coach missing thing is huge. And I think if Daryl made one cardinal mistake, captainless last year, captainless this yep. now concluding yep. season – I think that's a cardinal cardinal mistake. And I think there's a lot of truth. Like, I don't think Daryl Sutter's a liar. I think he was legitimately trying to take the heat off his guys so that they could do his thing, or they could do their thing, and he could be the buffer, the moat, you know, and, and deal with the media and stuff like that. A lot of these former players will tell you from Chicago, San Jose, and even in Calgary the first go-round, a lot of players will tell you that Daryl fancies himself as the captain. I think that's true. I think, I think if that makes true. sense, you know, he wants to do the things that a cap or he does the things that a captain should be doing. Fully agree. Yeah, fully yeah, agree. But yeah. the interesting thing is, is he's lost, he's lost a communication channel. Uh, he's lost an advocate by not having, having a captain. He's lost uh, a buffer, which calms and slows everything down so yeah. that we can get our feet under us. Yep. And, and basically he's lost a moat <laughs> to use medieval terms where it's like, you know, you want to talk to me, there's your captain. Let's let's have a meeting with all of us so that we have some calmness and some team focus in the room. But getting back to my point, and your more importantly, your point, 
uh, about the NBA and these these emissaries of of achievement in the in the NBA being ousted third yep. round. Um, those are examples, in my view, and I'm not I'm not privy to what's going on there. Those are examples of where you lack the organizational hierarchy and structure of a program, and you start to listen to people who are talking out of their lane. I agree. And you know, LeBron James, undeniably uh, a franchise corner, cornerstone. He's, Are you reading this? I'm absolutely <laughs> reading this. I don't want to mess this up. This is this is just a game pod, podcast, and I am this bringing is, my a game. This is fantastic. If this is the just B Big, game, I know. If this is not B just B game. Or this C is game. just yeah. a, a game. game. Gotcha. Podcast. Yeah. This is okay. the, no. It's this is really important. Bro. Yes, I understand. That. So if you're going to mock me, I, I will take it. I even not, less seriously not, than I normally do. I am not mocking. <laughs> I am not mocking. But but anyway. So I'm going to hold this up. I don't know if I'm a camera. Or not. You, you go ahead. Have you Add, got a telestrator? No, we stop it. We right will there. next time for <laughs> sure. We'll load it in, and you can read it. Nobody will see the sheet next time. Well, that's that's good. But anyways, Le <laughs> LeBron James, undeniably a franchise cornerstone legend. Say what you will, unquestionably has a pretty big say about the roster con construction and the and the organizational steps that 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 club takes. Yeah. Full stop. That's not his lane. He lost in the third round. He got swept, I think, in the third round. So, you know, that's a guy who should be busy doing, and I'm going to yep. do, do the yep. contrast with, yep. with, with that, uh, with, with uh, Jonathan Huberto. The funny thing is you should be really, really busy carb loading, working <laughs> out, resting, napping, you know, taping yeah. sticks, yep. doing your stuff. You got a lot to do. If you are going to be your best, you don't have time. It's an eyes on your own paper situation for me. Yep. The other thing that I wanted, and, and I don't think Jonathan Huberto and a few others did that. I thought they, and I don't know any of these guys. I just, mm -hmm. it, there's, the, there's the saying, right? Your actions speak so loudly, I can hardly hear what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I watched a lot of their actions on and off the ice. And, and it kind of blows my mind that this is where we came to. You know, I look at, um, as another example of, of, of staying in your lane or not staying in your lane. It took, and I'm going to read this because this is like, I don't want you getting hate mail, Rob. And I'm getting laughs from the gallery too. So I'm glad we're having a nice time. But it took Hall of Famer Marion Hosa a few tries before he picked a winner to win three cups, 2010, 2013, and 2015, yep. to find, and to find his way to the Hockey Hall of Fame. Yep. So if players could do this, if, you know, and I'm not going to invoke the, the, the cup pursuit of one of my all time favorite hockey players, let alone Flames players, Jerome McGinley. Yeah. He thought he probably would find a, a good home and a competitive team and a path to the Stanley Cup with Colorado. I wish he had. Nothing would make me happier than to, to see Jerome with a, with a cup ring. Honest player, hardworking player. Okay, stop right there. What if Kachuk and Bennett win? Well, this is, this is really good. Um, are you asking me who I'm favoring in the Stanley Cup final? Because I, I have notes on this Let too, Let me Rob. read my notes. <laughs> Well, go ahead. No, no, I'm I'm curious. Like, I, I, when he went, when he was traded uh, to Boston, or sorry, traded to Pittsburgh, um, I wanted him to win. Yep, and, totally. And it got a little elongated and and bounced around a little bit. And I thought with LA might, but it just you know it never worked, right? Um, but yeah, I same thing with Kiprasov. Favorite, my favorite goalie of all time, not the best goalie of all time, just my favorite goalie sure. of all time. I'd like him to have that. I wish he had that accolade. Hundred you know? percent. It's in in the Jerome thing is very different from the Matthew Matthew Kachuk thing for mm. me. Okay, because there's popular lore out there, and I've since confirmed what I think is the true path of the popular lore on Jerome's departure. Mm -hmm. And I have it on very good authority mm -hmm. that Jerome McGinley never asked to leave. I'm pretty sure I can show you where he asks in a game against the uh, uh, LA Kings. You remember they had to be in the uh, shortened season because of the lockout, they had the back-to-back -back games in Los Angeles and Roman Trevenka was playing and Roman Trevenka crapped his pants when Dowdy was coming down, <laughs> took the puck away from him and made it three, nothing in the second period. And there's this famous cutaway shot of Jerome on the bench and his eyes rolling in the back of my head. It makes me sleep at night that that's the, I feel like that's the moment he decided now's the time to leave. Really? Was yeah. that a Denny Lemieux mo uh, moment from Slapshot? Yeah. Trade think, me right, right now. now. Yeah. It just, that's <laughs> what pops in my head. Anyway, I, sorry that, about that. And that's fun. And, yeah, and yeah. that's great. But, but, 
Jerome did not ask to be traded in my in my limited mm -hmm. outsider understanding. And there's popular lore that says, well, you know, he wanted out, he wanted Chase Cups. Like, no, if the opportunity was foisted on him, which I, in my view, it was, mm -hmm. he's gonna he's gonna go seeking a cup. Yep. Matthew Kachuk said, yeah, you know, not feeling it. Nice people here. And two months earlier, he said, yeah, or maybe three months earlier, mm -hmm. he said. Love it. Want to stay. People are great. Opportunity mm -hmm. team. Blah blah blah. All mm -hmm. the all the right things. Mm -hmm. And 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 then it's like, well, then he went. Denny Lemieux, mm -hmm. trade me right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tra trade me right effing now. Yeah. And 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 I don't think that's the same thing. So when it comes down to who I favor in the Stanley Cup playoffs, I favor Vegas. And I think and I think there's a lot of reasons for it. I've been hate watching. <laughs> the Florida Panthers. <laughs> uh, hey, I think that's what God bless. If that's how, you, if it's called hate watching, hate watch. And yeah, I do it with the Oilers. Like when I watched, I watched the Vegas uh, Oilers series with like great enthusiasm for how how the the, the Golden Knights did did a number on him. I don't blame you. And and so that's the thing. But I, I think I think this whole Stanley Cup final is a case study. Uh, it's it's a case study in player development, asset management. And frankly, loyalty for both the players uh, and the organizations. Do tell. I think it's you want. I want to hear why. You want to hear why? Well, yeah. what's interesting is is the player development side is is a big part of it. We've got Sam Bennett, arguably a frustrating and frustrated player through the entire course of his 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 career with the Flames. Tons of upside. Couldn't find his path for whatever reason. Found his path just before he got traded with Daryl. Interestingly. Up. that last month or so that he was there he had figured it out or daryl had helped him figure it out which or or whatever happened mm -hmm. so turned into a pretty good player and then somehow he still disappeared mm -hmm. and i think if my memory serves me that was the very first draft pick that brad for living he made did, as, he, a Cal he, as a as a calgary is, flame gm that is correct yeah. so that's kind of neat so that entire arc was about player development and how brad for living may have managed that mm -hmm. um with the opportunities and incursions that he was able to make elsewhere in the organization. He's the boss. He should be able to go into any meeting, mm -hmm. any room and talk to anybody about anything he wants. Correct. That's his job. Right. That that's one example of player development, which is oops, didn't work. And then there's guys like, uh, like the guys who came from Florida, Marcia. So, and, 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 uh, Help me. Oh, in Vegas. I'm sorry, Mar uh, Smith, isn't it? Yeah, Smith, Smith, and Marshall Marshall came so. yes. out of Florida. Sorry, I thought you were talking about Calgary. Marshall's in Vegas. What are you talking about? What? <laughs> There's a new Mexico. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> but no, like Marshall so and Smith yep. were essentially discards from Florida. Yep. So again, there's a classic example of player development failure or lack of asset management. Marshall's a pretty good hockey player. Smith, not not. A bad hockey player. So when you talk about player development, those guys, organizations did not line up on player development, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was with Florida or whether it was with with uh, with with uh, Vegas or whoever. Mm -hmm. When the people moved, um, that's a that's a case study. It's like okay, well, we can make the silk purse out of whatever mm -hmm. you got, uh, and and both teams have. Yeah, but they're the opposite of of Tampa and, and you could make the case Colorado. No, nah, Colorado is not the right one. Tampa, homegrown goalie, homegrown defenseman, homegrown up front stars. Sounds easy, eh? It, it, right? Yeah. Like if you had a program or something. Yeah. Where, but who, I mean, who knew? who's who's traded more and who's taken bigger risks than the Vegas Golden Knights in the last four or five well, years, Well, that's right? the interesting to the loyalty point that I was, I was gonna, gonna raise too. It's like, cause you've got Matthew Kachuk who basically did a, military 180 foot yeah. turn and and changed in three months from yep. i want to be here to denny lemieux trade me right f and now yeah um so that was like a, a an explosive departure um get me out of here what if he didn't want to play for the coach well then then i'm puzzled by that when when you have a guy who helps you figure out how to become not just a star but a superstar and then maybe a maybe a, a heart and, trophy and I, candidate by the way i'm not I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm only adding that question in there is that, is that part of this equation? Because you lost two superstars that summer, last summer, right? I, I think. And Matthew, one of them, Matthew's not as egregious as Johnny in the sense that Johnny left 15 mil in a, in a year on the table. Fully agree. Right. 
fully agree. Yeah. Um, and no, I, I, I think, I think, uh, Matthew Kachuk wanted flip flops, uh, to wear to the rink. And I think he wanted to drive his sea do there, uh, to go to practice and, and that's fine. And they golf and, and they do all of those all things, of those things, things yeah. which some people really enjoy. They do. So I, I think that that was a problem. He, he vacated his team. Uh, I think the coach helped him to achieve stellar levels of elite hockey. He's, he's in the conversation for the con Smythe. It's like, do you think that, that, uh, the guy, the coach who hated him, Paul Maurice, when he played them in the playoffs, when he was coaching Winnipeg, just changed that oh, guy. Oh boy, did he? Yeah. No, I don't think that <laughs> happened. I no, 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 I, no, he didn't. I mean, one of four players to score a hundred points on two different teams, in two separate years or kind of a, in consecutive kind of years, deal. right? Kind of a big deal. Do you know who one, one lives here in town? One, one's Calgary kid. Um, Sure. Uh, maybe it's uh Kale. Mike Rogers. Mike. Oh yes. The 50, 50 goal store score, uh, New York Rangers star and the Hartford Whalers. A wonderful guy. Yeah. It, you should have him on more. I'm trying. You he know. won't respond to me. Well, I thought we know. were friends. Well, you know, yeah, that's you probably go. one of two things. <laughs> that's causing that, one Rob. of two things. I know <laughs> something you and said, I know or who's some, two. <laughs> something you said <laughs> or something you did. did right. Yeah. Um, anyways, you know, I, I just, I just cheer more for, um, the unvarnished, ambition of the vegas golden knights where they say our loyalty is to the crust on the front and if we decide that that uh mark andre Fleury is not going to be our goalie then this is about the team and we're making a move and we're ruthless goodbye max patch yeah well all of that yep. um you know and it's 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 a fast turn they're six years out and yep. they're behind schedule they wanted to win a cup in five years everybody's going to be mad about that but they've had success by being loyal to the crust on the front and dealing with player player development, maybe not so much asset management because there's lots of questionable stuff that got moved and and things like that. And I'm anything but an expert on that, but it's pretty interesting to see. No, that. I I I love that because I think this is such a copycat league, right? Yeah. And we always say, "Ooh, did you see what Tampa did? You got to do what Tampa did." Okay, that's one version of it. You, you could do, you know, how Florida did, like Florida. Again, one point behind the Calgary Flames. Who's behind? Who's going, who's who's going into the scouting meetings going this year? Hey, let's do it like Florida did. Well, they right? will. They will be now. Well, are they though? Like, or are they going? Maybe we're the next Florida. Yeah. Well, well, maybe. But you know, the the other thing I like about Vegas is they put a lot of pressure on other teams to perform and turn it around quick and and make something from arguably nothing. Which I will say. Brad for living did last August. Well, and I or July or whenever we, he made we the, that trip. Honestly, I've never got out of question one. Oh, okay. I mean, you did your preparation, but I did some too. So let me ask you that. I brought my A, a game, game. I know 25, 20 going into your 25th year as a season yes. ticket holder. That three day desolate gap between the Kachuk trade and the Goudreau signing and nothing where was your head at what were you what were you screaming you know who were you burning an effigy what would you <laughs> and, and the reason i say that is still at csec at that time i would go into the customer service department and it was death like it was not you know uh happy people calling right and the the, the doom and gloom around the sa- they don't want to say this publicly the sales people were scared Crap and they're really nice, hardworking people in that department. They, they are. They've treated me great. They, and and hats off. Been, and if you don't who's have your account rep, well, I have Andrew Swan, Swanee, okay. who is the gold standard. He is the gold standard. And I have Andrew Chapel. And those I guys. I don't know Andrew Chapel, but I know Swanee real good. They're both phenomenal. Oh, Swanee's the they're, best. They're super professional. They get it. Yep. They've been around a while. They they see it from all sides. But anyways, so I Swanee, feel bad a for big those esports uh, esports guy. By the way, well there you go. There you go. You should have him on. Actually, I'm going to. Well, good. Well, you book it then. If you think it's so damn easy to do a podcast, you book it. Well, I'm going to start my. No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, but no, I, I feel bad for the guys. Those guys taking those calls, and I wasn't burning anybody in effigy, but I was really questioning the character of the the players who just kind of turned and moved. Yeah. Um. And and I. I don't want, and I don't want to disparage the legacy of Brad for living. I think he was an earnest, hardworking, diligent, fervent advocate, like tireless. Mm -hmm. And I think he did a lot of stuff at the time, which very, very few fans could disagree with. But I think with the benefit of hindsight, oh yeah, we're seeing that maybe there was some emotional reactions, um, 
like maybe handing Huberdeau the 10 and a half? I would say that went all the way up to the top of the chain. Perhaps because they wanted to keep Anthony Cox happy. Well, they really? want it. Yes. Turn, turns out that didn't work out. Well, <laughs> it's not that they didn't try. Well, there you I go. would, I would suggest that it was so gloomy and, and everybody was so concerned about what was coming and what it was going to look like and tumbleweeds and all of those sort of things that, you know, Brad, you move mountains if you have to. And the tumbleweeds have happened before. Yes, they have. And that's not a fun place it, to be Apathy around. is death. Yep. Apathy is death. And, and that was what you perhaps were looking at. It wouldn't have been that, you know, it still would have been a roster, but to have that gut punch and no response, especially to me, Anthony, it kind of felt like it was just a continuation of the second round series. Your provincial rival stomped you in four games after you won the first one. And now not only are we going to beat you, we're going to take your sister, right? Or we're going to kick your dog, or we're going to do all of those sort of things, right? Like, you know, it was just, disaster for so, a Flames fan. So I think, yeah, it was disaster. And I was like, what the heck are they going to do here? But I had some confidence in Treliving and, and I, and I haven't lost that. I think he's going to do a great job. I think he's learned so much from what happened in Calgary that he's going to bring to the Marner and Matthews contract E situation E type stuff. But I have to tell you the first mark was on the wall, the tell with Johnny Goudreau. And I think, I think if Treliving had a shortcoming, it's he, he is, is he was too trusting. Mm-hmm. And he took players at their word mm -hmm. and and believed in their character. Mm -hmm. And and I think that might have been been the thing. The first tell on on Johnny Goudreau for me mm -hmm. was when he was holding out for a six point seven five times six uh, contract uh, when he was an RFA. And when did he sign? I think he signed like October thirteenth or fifteenth or something of that year. Mm -hmm. And and so I don't know if Alan Walsh was his agent at the time. No. But that's a brinksmanship that, again, comes from the client, not not the agent. And if that's his choice, that's what he's doing. That's the first tell, and I think that did, relationship need to be managed a little better. Did Jerome not hold out once? I think more than once, actually. Okay. Like one was a real holdout, and one was a brink. Uh, and maybe that's the Jerome McGinley NHLPA playbook that that I'm repressing on. But yeah, but, well, that, 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 to your point, that. That's fair. But I guess I guess my point on this whole thing is cheer for Vegas because they draft well, they okay. they develop well. Okay. And and uh that that said they beat the Oilers. Okay. And well, and so, you know, so they have that going for them. And would and, you and consider coming back so I can ask you question number two? <laughs> you have another question. <laughs> I had another question that I never got. That's like a honest lot of preparation, to God. Robert. Honest to God. <laughs> That's a lot honest of preparation. Two uh, questions. I mean, honestly, we never even got what's your favorite memory of the dome? Never got there. Uh, this was fun. This is what I was hoping it would be. I knew it would be with you. Um, I love you, dude. You're the best. Uh, I just, you come at it from such a great angle and you're so much fun and, uh, and you got a good, uh, a good, well, you can laugh at yourself, which is something that not a lot of people can do. So God bless you, sir. Thank you for doing this. Thanks, Rob. Good to see you. Good to see you, sir. Anthony you. Cox, everybody. He is our, well, it says right here, consulted with Anthony from time to time for his professional perspective on topical business and legal aspects on the NHL over the years. 100% correct. If you need to do that. Look them up. Our guest brought to you by Ski Seller Snowboard, skisellersnowboard.com. It's warm. I don't know if you noticed that, uh, but you're going to need, uh, you're going to need warm clothes soon because the, the winter's coming back. I understand. Uh, we're only about four months away, five months away. Uh, check them out. Skisellersnowboard.com. Uh, one location right now. One they they have four, but only one in the in the summer. McLeod Trail by Chinook Center. Coming up on Monday, uh, we can confirm Brent Cron will be on the show. We did that as we started today, <laughs> and Ryan Pike. So hell, and then I I'm pretty sure that Anthony's going to start booking the show. I believe is what he said halfway through. Uh, we're not, by the way, we're live in the Oodle Noodle studio. We're not just crazy about noodles. We put the same energy back into the community. Two locations, 1244 17th Avenue Southwest, 105 Main Street North in Airdrie. Pickup and delivery. I, I definitely saw him come in. All right. Where's, where he is, is he? here? He is I here. just, okay. He's, <laughs> there he is. There he is. Okay. We're going to keep doing the show. It's like a telethon. Just, <laughs> 
Just walk right, right, right past the, the mic. There we go. He's there. Okay. Did we not talk about that earlier yeah, today? We called that for sure. We called that for sure. I don't care because he's the best. He's one of our favorites, and he was kind enough to be the first person to giant sign up for this show as our insider. Brought to you by Ski Seller Snowboard, ski seller snowboard.com. 76 years. One location right now, McLeod Trail by Chinook Center. But when everything gets going in the fall, there will be four. Eric Dahachuk from The Athletic. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, too. It's Friday afternoon. I'm always good on Friday Are, are you afternoon. okay with an audience? Absolutely. Anthony wants to stay and watch. Big Absolutely. Yes. Remember last week when we were talking about the music show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was one of them. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we can talk about music, but let's talk about hockey because there's a lot of hockey to talk about. <laughs> uh, dealer's Choice, where do you want to start? Well, I, I'm good. Because you start. and I, because just the way this works, mm -hmm. we've missed... Let's start with Craig Conroy yeah. and being named the general manager. Well, uh, I know you know because you read my column that I fully and heartily endorsed it when uh, you know when when it was clear that there was going to be an opening. Well, first of all, I mean I think he should have been a general manager of the National Hockey League long before this. I think that he had paid his dues. He had only had the single interview with uh, with the Buffalo Sabers. It was perplexing to me that people on you know that do what I do whenever there was an opening and would list the you know mm -hmm. this bright young voice and that right young face and so on and so forth of of people that teams might hire that that Craig Conroy's name very rarely appeared on those lists and and I think it's you know because lots of people in, in the industry are always looking for the new shiny toy and and you tend to overlook the people that do things the old fashioned way which is you retire as a player and then you learn basically you know the the hockey equivalent of the, of the mail room is is you know you 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 do everything yep. right you yep. you start in the office and you learn about the salary cap and you learn how contracts are managed and you just you you get inside the door of those boardrooms and and the first 12 months are a complete eye opener it's like i didn't know this i didn't know that i didn't know this i didn't know that but what happens is you put in the time the way Craig Conroy did you get out on the road and scout and and you you then check all the boxes or climb all the rungs in the ladder whatever you want to do and then suddenly you are prepared to take that on and your resume is out there and and other than you know Buffalo kicking tires that one time uh, no one gave him a look and I think that probably at, at a certain point he was wondering if he would ever get a look and he did even say at the at the press conference that uh you know he thought he might be a gm by now but he never thought it would be calgary so this this is a really good outcome in fact i think i think the all three of the moves that are kind of interconnected craig conroy here brad tree living to toronto kyle dubas yeah. to, to to pittsburgh it gives everybody a fresh start um a fresh opportunity to stamp their own mark on on the team i mean i thought it was instructive that you know as uh uh, you know, as as open as Craig Conroy was at, at the press conference, it was very clear from the beginning that he had his own ideas about how to steer this thing forward. And I mm -hmm. think that they really corresponded with what the fan base in this market was hoping for for a long time too, which is that these players that have been apprenticing, you know, for the Wranglers need to be given an opportunity to play in the National Hockey League. And that, that's just that's just a way of doing business in, in today's NHL. Like I, I'm thinking, you know, there's Toronto putting Matthew in excuse me in the lineup at the at the last minute and him making a contribution uh you know uh, you know seattle going to tie Karche and, and you know making a contribution and and calgary refusing to do that when they really needed that push from young players the energy that they provide the skill level that they provide i mean if the flames win a few more games in overtime and then the shootout they're in the playoffs and then who knows what what might have happened and the players that might have contributed to that were watching rather than playing so you know simply telling people in the organization publicly and privately that we are not going to go out and sign 30 year olds to you know to one-way nhl contracts but we are going to keep some roster spots open and you come to training camp and you know there's an opportunity to win a spot but you better be ready to win it because yep. we are not going to hand you a jersey and so i think that provides extra motivation for all of the young players that have been waiting for an opportunity and let's face it rob you know these guys can all add or if they can't their agents can and when you've got 13 one-way contracts on the roster you know that your opportunity of making it out of training camp is, is very slim so so have it simply that part of the vision and 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 stating it so publicly and so emphatically right at the beginning i think you know sends a, a positive message throughout the organization the other thing is 
you know, being at that press conference, you just felt, you know, walking into the Dome a lot of times over the past 12 months, and I didn't do that much, but but I was there enough. And there was just sort of a cloud that kind of hung over there. You know, it was not mm-hmm. a fun or happy workplace. And, and and a professional ice hockey team is no different than working for a you know a, a website like the Athletic, like I do, or yep. or in, or any job that anybody out there has. You know, ultimately you are reporting to someone, and and your job is a lot easier if the atmosphere that you're working in is is positive and 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 collegial and and interactive, and and people are listening to people up and down the the, the chain. It, it just makes it happier to jump out of bed in the morning and think, yeah, I want to go out and do my job. And I didn't have that sense around Calgary the last 12 months or so. And then you walk in again and there's, you know, Craig Conroy sitting there and and his personality is infectious and it lifts people. And that matters. I mean, it matters. It's a workplace. It it is a workplace. And and so I think that workplace is going to be um, a happier place. And, and, and as a result of that, a more productive place. I, uh... The one thing that I have said, because I was out all the last week and I've come back and I've said it a couple of times, just watching the coverage and the way that Connie was, Craig Conroy, sorry, was portrayed. I, 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 I'm a little concerned that people think he's happy go lucky. There's some bite to oh, that yeah. dog, right? No doubt about it. Yeah, and I, I wrote that in one of my pieces too. That that th- there's a competitor there, that, and you don't you don't go from being the sixth round draft choice of, of the Montreal Canadiens and having to fight and claw your way to the NHL, and then having the kind of NHL career that Craig Conroy had over a thousand games, you know, close to the Stanley Cup final, number one center, Selkie candidate, a number of, of different years. If you don't have some backbone, if you don't have some bite if you don't have a competitive edge uh, you're not going to survive and and i think you know it was best illustrated in all of the stories that have come out over the years about his friendship with jerome Mm -hmm. mcginley i mean they would be competing over video games in banff at you know at team retreats i mean they they both had that in them you know they they're competitive and 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 those things you know like i I always think that uh like we all have a competitive streak some for some people it's completely off the charts and for some people it it has to be pushed out but but if you don't have it i i I just don't think that you can have success at at professional hockey it has to be you know, from visceral and and from within in the person, and 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 I think that Craig Conroy's history as a player and then as a manager is that he's got that. I mean, you know, what did he say? He, he wants to win the Stanley Cup. That is the th- a thing that he you know he a box that he wants to check on his resume, and he came really close once as a player, and and the only way to do it right now is is as a manager. Um, you know, he talked about possibly you know going to coach Clarkson when his playing career was over and. You can't win a Stanley Cup coaching coaching Clarkson. You know you're only going to be able to do it in in an NHL front office position. So, so I think that you know that 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 is something else. Again, if if you're a fan of of the hockey team, you want to hear that. What what do people want here? They, they want a championship. Yep. It's been a long yep. time, and and they want it again. And they know that in a 32 team NHL, again, everybody can do the math. It, it's harder than ever to do it. Everybody's competitive. Everybody has smart people. There's a salary cap that limits what you can and can't spend. So it it's hard. But I think that you know there are pieces in place here that suggest that you know you have a chance to certainly be a playoff team and if if this year's stanley cup finals and really the stanley cup finals of the last six years will tell you anything that that old truth about you know just get in and you never know that that is true because this is the third 16th seed in six years that is in the stanley cup final now having said that the last two didn't win but they got to the stanley cup final they punched a ticket they gave themselves a chance so you know if you look at you know uh, objectively at florida on paper 92 points calgary on paper 93 and then think about you know how many players in calgary underachieved i mean that that's a good hockey team so i don't think you have to tear it apart i think you need to get everybody going in the same direction and not at cross purposes which seemed to be a lot of what happened this year and then see where see where you're at but the other thing where you know uh, his you know um, managerial style uh, differed and and he wasn't afraid to say it is that we just cannot afford to lose assets and and get nothing in return Mm. he specifically cited johnny gaudreau and what the implications were there and i think you and i both know that they really thought that gaudreau was going to sign and right up until that last minute I, i think they felt that that they were going to get a yes and then it ended up being a no at the 11th hour and it it was almost as if you know he had he had 
thought you know he was going in one direction and then somehow you know changed yep. at, at, at the last minute so yep. hard to to gauge against that but but you can if you're proactive and you get out in front of it and so th that's why this summer will be interesting um i do think that you know that there is a a a, 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 a Sorry about that. No, it's all good. Yeah, there there is an implication sometimes that uh, um, you know you can wait on players that are going into those uh, uh, final years of their contract uh, uh, until the trade deadline and possibly you know get something for them. And uh, um, you know that I suppose is is an option for Calgary. But I think that you know once they have a coach in place, uh, they'll have a, a, a you know a better idea of uh, of who might be you know. Uh, retained and, and and who might be, be moving on but but i think that we're going to see some decisiveness and the decisiveness will be earlier than 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 it has been in the past is there any danger of staying internal for the coaching candidate too if you stay internal with the general manager yeah. is it too much of the well uh, you know what rob that's a good question so uh, so again if, if 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 it's if you're asking me to put on my general manager's hat I, i'd like to see ryan huska get a shot at, at the job I, yeah. I, to me Again, if it's me, I'm hiring him. I, you know, I look at, at again, his resume. You know, he has coached at the American Hockey League level. He's been a successful coach at, as an assistant and associate at, at the National Hockey League level. Uh, it just feels like he is ready. You know, you talk to him. He's a smart guy. Um, he, I, I think that he he has he has the ability to command the room. I mean, you know, part of you know, coaching, you have to do so many things, right? You have to be able to manage people. You have to be able to... Uh, to you know, create a, a strategy. You have to be able to at least hire the right assistants to to put in place special teams and and and, and systems play. I, I think he can do that. Mm -hmm. I think he can do that. I think the risk of promoting someone like Mitch Love, who I think you know, I don't know him really at all, but but I would suggest that that he is probably in the same position that Spencer Carberry was in when Spencer Carberry was a rising star in yep. the Washington organization, yep. went to Toronto as an assistant because learning the National Hockey League, it, I mean, that that has value. You know, I used to travel with a team for decades. And the first time around the National Hockey League, when you're learning, you know, when you're going to airports that you haven't been to, when you're going to hotels you haven't been to, when you're going to, and finding the arena entrances that you haven't been to, when you go to the visitor's locker room that you haven't, it's a learning experience, you know, and, and you, you, you just drink it in so much that first one or two times around the league. And then after that, you kind of know your way and you just, there's a, a comfort level. And so I think that there's value in that. So Spencer Carberry's path was, you know, a successful coach in, in the American hockey league. I believe he was the AHL coach of the year, the, the year before Mitch, Mitch Love won the yeah. two goes to Toronto associate coach hired in, in Washington and now will get his opportunity. So that, that, that seems like the, the 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 next path forward for Mitch Love. You know, either become mm -hmm. an assistant on the staff here or or somewhere else. And and you know, I'm sure that a door will open for him. You know, very soon down the road in in the NHL. But there is value to to coaching at the NHL level. And and you know, in, in terms of Kirk Muller, you know, it's funny. You like to move the pieces around. I think Kirk Muller would be the perfect coach in Anaheim. Like I I think they've interviewed. 5,000 people there by the sounds of it. Virtually everybody that has a coaching resume has been spoken to on some level by, by Pat Verbeek. But I look at the situation in Anaheim. You know, they've, they've already gone and hired a new coach for, for San Diego. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he's coming from, from the German League and he has a great resume. And a lot of people believe he is going to be the coach in waiting. So what you need in Anaheim right now is somebody to come in and be a positive influence, knowing that that organization is, is, is it's very much a, a beginning of, of a rebuilding stage. So you need positivity because you're going to be losing a lot, you know? So I think of, you know, Kirk Muller's personality is, you know, going back to when he was coaching Queens, his ability to, to work with young players, you know, he seems like the perfect fit. He has a connection with Pat Verbeek that uh, going back to their playing days that, that I think matters. And so um, I'd like to see him get a chance to, mm -hmm. to, to take over the team in Anima. I think he'd be a really good fit and it would get a chance to get his NHL career back on track. And then if, if at some later point down the road, you know, they feel that they, they, you know, need to, to go in a different direction, they could. Cautionary tale though, from uh, Peter Marr brought it up on Wednesday. So I'll bounce it off you because he's one of my favorites. And that was Jimmy Playfair. Jimmy was yeah. assistant, then mm -hmm. made the head coach mm -hmm. for Ryan Huska. What, pitfalls or traps do you have to avoid if you're escalated like that well i, th I think that you know the the role of the assistant coach is different than the head coach and a lot of times he's the the buffer between you know the 
you know, the, mm-hmm. the players and, and, and the head coach. I think that was an important role uh, the, this past year. And so, you know, when you become the head coach, you're, you know, no longer the player's friend, you know, you are the head coach and, and your voice might be a little more strident than it was a, as an assistant coach. But, but I, I, you know, I think Jim Playford did a really good job, and I think I wish they'd stayed with him longer. I think again, you know, to to judge someone as as quickly uh, as you, you some as it sometimes happens in the National Hockey League uh, can be a mistake. You know, I, I'll go, you know, and, and cite the case of someone else that you know really well, Jared Bednar, right? Yep. So, Jared Bednar gets hired out of the American Hockey League after a very successful run in Cleveland there, goes to Colorado, has one of the worst mm-hmm. seasons in the post-salary cap era, 48-point team. And and and, and it looks to every, all of the people from the outside as if he's a guy that uh, that is going to be, you know, sacrificed for that poor season. And and God bless Joe Sackick for sticking with him for for see the things that he saw in Jarrett Bednar when he hired him uh, 12 months later were, were still there. And yep. he gave him another chance. And you know, he just signed a contract extension to make himself one of the highest paid coaches in in the National Hockey League. But his career, NHL coaching career, was teetering in the balance yep. there. And he had a manager that showed faith in him, and that faith proved to be the right move. And if, you know, if we could go back in, in time and have seen if Jim Playfair had had a little bit, uh, a longer leash, could he have evolved into a successful NHL coach? I firmly believe he could have. In fact, I see a lot of, you know, like when I think about Jim's personality, I see a lot of that in, in Ryan Huska. Yeah. Um, you know, Jim went on to, you know, be an assistant coach in Arizona, and I was down there a lot for a period of time. You know, his kid, you know, Dylan, his son, was just getting into acting. I remember the first time he told me about it uh, and this television show that he was in that I'd never heard of because I don't watch that. And then, <laughs> you know, he's turned out to have, you know, Dylan Playfair has had this tremendous uh, acting career. But I, I just think that, that um, someone needed to show a little bit more patience with Jim Playfair, and he would have been fine. I think it was hard in that Daryl Sutter shadow too, yeah. right? And having him yeah. as your general Absolutely. manager. Yeah. Um, speaking of GMs, 18th general manager in Toronto Maple Leafs history, but second general manager to come from Calgary. Uh, I, Brad, you're uh, living yesterday. I know. I wrote a column about that because uh, <laughs> I was around when the first one moved. But I do think there's a lot of parallels. So we're talking about Cliff Fletcher, of course. So, sure. so Cliff won the Stanley Cup here with Calgary in 1979. He was the general manager that overseed the move of the, the team from Atlanta to Calgary. And in 1991, I know he was looking for a new challenge. Uh, you know, his kids had uh, been launched. Um, his wife, Boots, uh, w- wanted to be in Florida a lot. He, he, he was just here alone by himself a lot and was looking for something new so you know resigned from the flames and you know in over you know a period of months uh, an opening came up in toronto uh, he replaced floyd smith as the general manager he made the trade that ruined the flames uh, a few months later by you know plucking doug gilmore and jamie mccowan and rick natris rick walmsley <laughs> out of calgary and I won't even bother going through the <laughs> Gary Lehman, Alexander. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. but, 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 you know, he did, you know, in a very short period of time, make the Leafs relevant again. And, yep. and, and, you know, it, it, that was a team that came very, very close mm-hmm. 1993, 1994 in those playoffs to, to, to at least get into the Stanley cup final. Um, a lot of people, you know, re- will remember very well that, you know, seventh game of Toronto, Los Angeles and, in 93, the, the, I know the hope of people writing was that that would be a Toronto-Montreal final, uh, which would have been great. Didn't happen. And then Montreal ended up winning the Stanley Cup in Patrick Waugh's, you know, year where he had 10 overtime wins. But um, but I think one of the, the things that I think you can learn from that Cliff Fletcher exper- experience or experiment was that you can hire the right guy. Like Cliff Fletcher was the right guy at that mm-hmm. time. You know, the Leafs were were a laughing stock, you know, post Harold Ballard, and and he restored credibility to that franchise. Still didn't win, you know, and they're still waiting to win. And and I think that that's that's part of the problem that you know that everybody everybody wants uh, to have a Stanley Cup parade. Players want to have Stanley Cup rings. They want their names engraved on the Stanley Cup. But I mean, the reality is, he was the right man for the job. Did a great job. Still didn't win. Eventually, they they tried someone else, and and I, I honestly believe they went backwards after they they went away from Cliff Fletcher, and then he was back again in two thousand and eight to try and and salvage 
the franchise again had some a lot of of salary cap work to clean up did a really good job there and then then handed the reins over to brian burke i think was the was next in line after cliff the second time so so yeah so that's a long preamble to the fact that you know here now is brad tree living going into a good team in toronto that is one of the big differences cliff inherited a terrible team you know brad tree living has has lots of good pieces there but he needs to be that general manager that takes them to the next level you know i often think about you know pittsburgh when when they won those uh you know when, when they had that that good initial run in 2007 2008 and ray sure was the general manager it was really craig patrick that to put that yeah. team together yeah. right yeah. when you think about colorado winning in 1995 the first year in denver it was really pierre page that put that team together so what pierre lacroix did for that team was he he got patrick Waugh in trade but the pieces the sackix the forsbergs they were all there uh, from the previous regime um you know when brian burke took over anaheim the pieces were put in place by brian murray and al Coates. so th there's a, a long history in the national hockey league of a general manager coming in at the 11th hour almost in in a in a building process and the test for them is going to be to take these very good pieces and then figure out how to get them over the top and 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 so that that implies a lot of pressure because toronto is at this stage of the game stanley cup or bust um they're capped out they have important contract decisions coming with with four key players uh the player that would be the one that you would if, if there was no no trades if, the, if you know if you could just wave a magic wand and and make things happen in, in the league if you could take the john Tavares contract out of the mix now you suddenly have lots of flexibility uh to to re-sign the other three big names matthews marner and uh and nylander solve your problem problem and goal you know and and otherwise the, the pieces look pretty good I, I do think that you know you can you know, find the right supporting cast to play in Toronto Kyle Dubas proved that there's an awful lot of people that will go to Toronto mm -hmm. and play for for small money by NHL standards in order to you know to be on a Leaf team that potentially could win so it's an interesting challenge and um and on, honestly I, I don't know how how you solve it other than you, you roll back 85 percent of the team that that had 111 points, um, sort out the goaltending, and know that in one year's time, you know, there'll only be a year left on Tavares's contract, and in two years' time, the contract will be gone. And the other thing that that doesn't get talked about a lot in the National Hockey League is, although the salary cap for next year is only going up by probably a million or two, um, it will jump significantly in two years' time. So any general manager operating right now better have a one-year plan and a two-year plan because the one-year plan allows you to be competitive, hopefully, in, in a year where money is going to be tight and knowing full well that the, the decisions that you make or the contracts that you can defer or the raises that you can defer to two years down the road, th there will be additional room in the system to, to pay those contracts. And so I, I think that 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 will be the case in Toronto. Everyone will want them to win next year, but but there's going to be f more flexibility and options in year two than there will be right out of the gate for Brad Tree Living. Um, should I worry about Brad? He's a friend of mine. I like Brad. He's a nice guy. Does he have the right armor to to be in Toronto? Well, that's a good question. So I, I you know, and I, you know, I, I think that. I hope somebody um, talks to him about that and and warns him about it because, uh, and I've related this story to you before, but I do remember having that conversation with Ron Wilson when he went in as a coach, and and Ron was you know considered himself media friendly and you know he was mm -hmm. gregarious and and well spoken and and he it was like I got it, Eric. I, I remember I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like I, you, know, you don't have to tell me how to you know handle myself in the media. And I said, but it just it's it's the relentlessness of it. I said that's the thing that will drive you crazy: the relentlessness of it. There's just so many people there, and 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 everybody wants a piece, and everybody wants to be your friend, and 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 it will just overwhelm you because you know like you never get a break from it. Now it's different being a coach because you're out in front of the microphone every day, and a manager. And in Toronto, the managers don't speak very often. But I do think that there is a tremendous amount of pressure um I, you know i think there's a, a lot of very friendly media in toronto mm -hmm. I, I think there's mm -hmm. you know a percentage of people especially you know a, a number of the ex-players there that just want the team to succeed and, and they actually have no problem just saying it you know i'm a fan you know and i want the team to succeed yep. the problem is if you're working in the media and you at, and you are responding like a fan and you want the teams to succeed a lot of times you react the way fans do when the team doesn't and and so you know i think that what Brad Tree Living needs to do is learn to filter all of that stuff out. And while there was always noise in, in Calgary, 
um, because it is a Canadian media market. It, 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 it was just a fraction of what he's going to face in, in Toronto. But I think he goes into it with his, his eyes wide open. And I think that he does have the kind of, you know, winning personality that, that makes a good first impression. Like I, you know, I have four colleagues at the athletic in, in, in Toronto that, that cover the Leafs essentially and, and, and don't do anything else. And, and overall the, the impression that he made in that first uh, press conference was very positive. I just, boy, oh boy, if you win there, man. Oh yeah. You get a statue. Uh, Cliff uh, Cliff basically told me that when he went there, you know, he said the person that can deliver a chance and this was 1991 when when the drought had only been (laughs) 24 years or whatever it was. Uh, If you can win there, they'll build a statue outside of Maple Leaf Gardens. So that was 91 and you know, another 32 years have passed and they're still waiting. So yes, you're right. The person who wins in Toronto will be, well, it'll be like the, you know, the Rangers being remembered in 1994 for breaking a 54 year drought. They're still you know, Mark Bessier can walk on water there. He can do no wrong because he was part of that team that uh, that helped them end that uh, Stanley Cup drought. So yeah, uh, if if it happens, and but Rob, it could. I I, I honestly yeah, I, I honestly thought this was like so the yeah. you know final starts tomorrow it, at the start of the of the the playoffs. If you had asked me, I would have said Edmonton, Toronto. Yep. That, that's who I th- I thought Edmonton, Toronto. That, that seemed the way the way Edmonton was playing down the stretch. Um, I thought Toronto had a real good chance against Tampa. I know a lot of people didn't like the goaltending matchup there, and especially after Florida took out Boston, that felt like okay, that's the one stumbling block. They could never get by Boston. There was a psychological thing about Boston. Florida took Boston out of the mix there, and then they couldn't beat Florida. So, you know, they. they they, they should be playing in the Stanley Cup final. And I'm sure internally that that's what they're saying today. We should be there, not Florida. So let's be careful not to overreact because we we couldn't get past them. They were on a roll. Things happened. Sergei Bobrovsky decided to be the second coming of George Vezina or Ken Dryden or whatever. Right. Um, and and so and that's a factor, you know, for every team. And you know, if, if you run into a, a goalie that that just as plays like a brick wall, sometimes it's it's just hard to get a, enough uh, offense. But um, yeah, I, I think I think they're close, and uh, and I don't think they have to do too much to, uh, to to get over the top. Maybe you just need to be a little bit luckier. Is is one of the the new rivalries in the National Hockey League? Brendan Shanahan and Kyle Dubas in Pittsburgh. <laughs> well, I don't know. That that's hard to say. I, I, you know, that would only you know be a result of a couple of you know public. Mm-hmm. Uh, Back and forth, um, you know, since, you know, they, they went through that entire soap opera there and now suddenly Kyle Dubas lands in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, it, it would be more of a rivalry if they were in the same division sure. and they faced sure. each other all the yeah. time and they were fighting for a place in the in the standings. I, you know, I think one of the things that, that Kyle Dubas said, and maybe he said it just to distance himself from, you know, the time in Toronto is what do we want to do? We want to win the division. That's the most important thing. We're in the Metropolitan Division. We want to win the Metropolitan Division with the team that we have and the team that we will, you know, ice in in October. And then we'll see, you know, what happens. I mean, you know, would would a Pittsburgh Toronto conference final <laughs> in May of 2024 be fun? Yeah. And then yeah. I think that you could maybe make that point that that is uh, you know, like could con, you know, conflicting visions, whether if you want to call it that, or, or you know, or a, a power struggle that you know one wanted to retain the power, one wanted to to get more power. I mean, that remains to be uh, to be seen. So uh, I, I think that that's one, honestly, that will fade to, to the background. Uh, you know, okay. the, Leaf, the Leafs are going to you know worry about their house. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pittsburgh has decisions to make, uh, especially in goal. And um, I mean, that, that, that to me is a fascinating situation because one of the things I did today was, um, was, was crunch the numbers. And, uh, you know, everyone is trying to compare Pittsburgh's group of three, which is Crosby, Malkin and Latang, to that group of four in, Tor- in Toronto. And, and, you know, the suggestion is that there's a, the similarity is there in terms of the impact of those players. But obviously the Toronto group is much younger. But the reality is different. I mean, the, those three Pittsburgh players together chew up about twenty million in the salary cap, right? So Malkin's at six six one, Latang is at six one, and Crosby is in his seventeenth year of earning a cap hit of eight point seven million. By the way, did you know Sidney Crosby's salary this year was three million? 
and that was going to be three million next year and three million the year actual after. Actual cash. Actual cash. Money in Sidney Crosby's pocket made three million dollars this year, and he'll make three million next year and three million in the final year of the contract. It was a front-loaded contract. Sure. Yeah. Twelve-year contract. You know, I think it was twelve million or something in the in the first year, but Sidney Crosby this past year and the next two years will have three million dollars in actual cash. So where does that put him around four hundredth in the NHL and, and <laughs> yes. actual compensation? I yeah. mean, the, there's a lot of fringe players on a lot of teams that are going to make more actual dollars than Sidney Crosby. So I think you know what his motivation are. But my my, my point is simply this: that it's twenty million allocated to three aging superstars no question aging but still contributing superstars yep. as opposed to you know uh, marner and and Tavares together are 22 million so more than those three combined so there's more flexibility in pittsburgh than you think and i think the biggest problem is that you know tristan jerry is just coming off the books at three five and you need a goaltending solution there now i i believe and i've said this for a while that john gibson is going to shake loose in anaheim um, I think I had him, well, we had him on our off season trade board in the top 10. I had him two when I put it together, but, but our, mm -hmm. our list is a merged list of three or four of us national writers. But, uh, but, you know, I went back and looked at what I wrote three weeks ago when we were doing that. And, and I said that I believe Gibson is going to be traded this year. And I believe there's three possible destinations. One is Pittsburgh, which is his hometown. One is Los Angeles, which is a team that desperately needs a goaltending, but that would be provocative to be yep. traded to a, a divisional rival. And the other would be Vegas, which again, you know, is swinging for the fences on everyone, but it's possible that, you know, just because of the way Aiden Hill has played, the fact that they still have Robin Leonard on the books, that that would be more difficult to, right. to manage. But, but if there's a way of getting, you know, John Gibson at 6.4 for four more years onto that team to stabilize the goaltending, um, probably have to move Granlin out. Maybe you'd look at moving Raquel out. There are some players in that $5 million range that probably shouldn't be there, but, mm -hmm. but, but that's, that, 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 that is salvageable. And, and Gibson to me, because I saw a lot of Anaheim uh, this, this past year, it, I think is still an elite level goaltender, even though his numbers don't imply that, you know, there were nights when he would make the first save and the second save and the third save and the fourth one would go in. And, and after a while, the body language, he just, look discouraged sure. some nights yeah. but on the nights when when it was a national game or when there was an opponent or, or when he had something to prove boy that he looked like you know john gibson top five goalie in, in the national hockey league so if i'm kyle dubas again i'm yeah. taking over uh, i'm making it a priority to get hometown kid john gibson in as my goaltender because i need somebody to you know to see out the last of the, the crosby malkin uh, latang era and He's the guy I think that could make them really competitive again. Talk about the Stanley Cup final in a second. I just want to ask you about Patrick Kane. Mm -hmm. Undergoes surgery mm -hmm. yesterday, four to six weeks, or four to six months, months sorry. Yeah. So now we're looking maybe on the outside, November, December, but still wants to play. Mm -hmm. When does he find a home? When he's healthy, or does somebody take a waiver on his recovery? That's a good question. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I think Carolina is is a team. So when you look at Carolina, and uh, you know, and especially you know, Don Waddell had his media availability this week, and if you read between the lines of what he said, I, I mean, he almost came right out and said that, that he's going to go bargain hunting again. So think about his moves last summer, right? So two key guys, one Max Pacioretty. Yep. So he he took on the full value of Pacioretty's contract, but basically got the player for free. So he got an elite level player because Vegas needed 7 million off the books. And he was willing to do that because it was only a one-year contract. Okay. So he gets hurt in training in the summer and they rehab and he gets back and plays five games. So bad luck, bad luck mm -hmm. for Max, bad luck for, for the Hurricanes. And then, you know, for, for Brent Burns, he, he got San because there was term left on the contract. He got San Jose to take back 33%. And so Burns checked in at five two and change, and he really gave him yeah. five two and change worth of uh, of of play, especially as a replacement to Tony D'Angelo. So that's the modus operandi in Carolina, and 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 I think that they're they're just sticking with their playbook. So they're going to look around and say, okay, where are the strategic buys? Mm -hmm. And I so I think you know, getting back to your question about Patrick Kane, I think he could be a strategic yeah. buy. That's a good enough team to muddle along without Patrick Kane for the first two three months of the years. Ultimately, Carolina will be judged by what they do in the playoffs in, in 2024. So if you're convinced, and certainly, you know, if you listen to Patrick Kane in this 
in his exit interviews in, in New York, he wants to keep playing. He thinks he can be still really effective. He had a pretty good year considering he could, you know, mm -hmm. he was so hampered and limited by the injury. So the comparison to me is what happened with Tamu Solani when he took, you know, a year and change uh, off of the game to get his knee done, the, you know, he came his hip, Solani was knee, but, but he, he, he was just so limited by his physical, ailments that that he couldn't play at the level that he was at and Kane suggested that if he can just get healthy again and that that you know that he he can still be an elite player and I think he can I don't think that his skill set has has been lost at yeah. all and his, his whole game is is you know creating space and and finding open ice 35 years old he's never he was never you know from goal line to goal line he was never the fastest play or he he mm -hmm. made room for himself on the ice because of his craftiness and, and his hockey sense so I mean, I'm looking for a home for Patrick Kane. I think people suggest that, you know, might go back to New York. Yeah, he might. You know, that would be good. But I think Carolina would be the perfect place for him. And, and I think they could probably get him on a reasonable contract. Maybe you sign him for one year and uh, and then, you know, learn, you know, what he's got left. Let him come to your community and your and your team and see what he can contribute and, and so on and so forth. But I, I, I think it's, it's good. I just... Like watching Patrick Kane play hockey. When you think about, you know, all of those small, shifty guys, you know, the the Canes, the Alex Debrinkets, you know, players like that. Um, what's going to happen with Debrinket? You know, he's got he's due a nine million dollar qualifying wow. offer <laughs> in Ottawa. And and again, you know, you're you're kind of reading the body language a little bit. You know, does that feel a little bit like the Chuck and the Gaudreau situation in in Calgary? That he's just not loving being in a small market mm -hmm. Canadian city and, and mm -hmm. doesn't really want to commit long term there and uh i mean if you're carolina which by the way has 24 million in cap space so they can do this why not go out and get to brinkett and kane get them both yeah you know i mean two small players do you want two small guys well if they're skilled enough you know maybe you do maybe you do <laughs> and uh and then all of a sudden now you've got maybe enough goal scoring to take you over the top because that was clearly the thing that they were lacking when they lost in the last round to florida so Florida and Vegas mm -hmm. in a Stanley Cup final. I've already run at the uh, television overlords for making us wait, and, and we've lost some people, but it will finally start tomorrow. Um, what do you make of this? Where do you give an edge? Well, it's hard to find an edge uh, unless you unless you focus strictly on the goaltending. So yeah. I, I do an exercise at the Athletic where I talk to a longtime executive scout and, and coach through every round, and and they're all really good. I mean, the the, the beauty of them is because we we grant them anonymity, they they give you the perspective that each of them brings. The you know the coach brings a coaching perspective, the executive brings a team building perspective, the scout brings a here's what I mm -hmm. you know what I'm seeing in the guy's perspective and and so when I called this week and asked them all about the series almost the first words out of their mouths were Bobrovsky right so they were seeing from Bobrovsky what we have occasionally seen in the playoffs where a goalie just gets on goes on a heater and and never stops you know J.S. Shiger for yeah. Anaheim you know Ken Dryden way back Patrick Waugh in 93 as we talked about before uh you know one of them brought up Steve Penny I brought up Jordan Bennington I mean we've seen mm -hmm. this you know we're we're a goaltender that you know like in some of these cases we're talking about Hall of Famers but you know J.S. Shiger you know he willed that Anaheim team to the Stanley Cup final against and and, and basically almost won it for them until they they, they lost to Jersey in game seven still ended up winning the MVP. So that's Bobrovsky in these playoffs. And he didn't even start the playoffs. They were going with Alex Lyon. So, you know, how did you see that coming? No one could see it coming. Florida couldn't even see that coming. But he is a two-time Vezina Trophy winner. And there was a reason they gave him eight years at 10 million a year, because at his best, he is he can be well right now he's the best goalie in the national hockey league. Yep. But he's the best goalie in the national hockey league and so you know and then you look at aiden hill so it, the co comparable to aiden hill i think is last year's darcy kemper right so what were we talking about a year ago going into the colorado tampa final right the one thing that you liked about tampa versus colorado vasilevsky against kemper one with this bulletproof pedigree previous championships darcy kemper eh, you know up and down but but not yeah. in the same league yeah. and i remember doing your friend you know bob mccown and john shannon's podcast and i'm saying good goaltending might be good enough and i got shouted down by all <laughs> three of them and when i reminded john shannon about that after the fact he said ah bob will have forgotten about it already and like, great you know <laughs> but so that that is that is my way of saying we can look at the matchup on paper and say Bobrovsky versus aiden hill 
it unquestionably favors Florida. Mm -hmm. But if Aiden Hill can do what Kemper did, and then if if Vegas can lean on on Florida and and that because they're big and strong and I love their fourth line. You know, normally when we talk about teams that they get this far in the playoffs, you focus on the third. Yeah, line, right? yeah, you know, that, yeah. You know, it's that That's you right. know Sammy Paulson guy or the Keith oh, Primo Sam, type. Yeah, somebody Paulson. like that. Paulson, like that. Mona Niedermeyer. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. So those those lines sometimes like if if teams are even, it, it's getting like an unexpected lift out, out of a third line that 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 makes the difference. So I'm watching that deciding game with Vegas and, and I don't know I practically jumped out of my chair do you know the goal I'm going to describe it's the Keegan Colasar goal right so Colasar takes the puck makes a bank pass off the boards you know carry a sloop swoops in grabs the Colasar goes to the net takes the return pass scores it was a beautiful goal it's the highlight of the night as far as I'm concerned yep. the highlight of the night was performed by the fourth, fourth line. line and I said that to all of my you know, my, my panel, I said, when did the fourth line make plays like that? That was the most skillful play in the game. And it was done by the fourth line. So I'm, I'm looking at the fourth line factor in uh, with Vegas. And that, that to me is, you know, like, you know, on, on the Florida side, you know, you make the case for Bobrovsky and Matthew Kachuk. And then after that, you know, the pieces fall mm -hmm. into place, but, but those are the, the two key X factors. But to me, that Vegas fourth line is the new third line and they're big and strong and tough. And as my coach said, they never hand off a bad shift, You put them out there. They never hand yeah. off a bad shift. Even if they don't score, they don't hand off a bad shift. So I think, I think that's, an important contributor on the Vegas side. And the other thing is uh, uh, just the way William Carlson is playing. Like we, we had a poll internally asking for, you know, MVP after three rounds. And, and because I think Vegas is going to win, I pick Carlson as, as, uh, as my con smite, I'll probably be the only one that, that does that. Um, and for sure, if it, if it ends up being Florida, you know, Kachuk or Bobrovsky, the voters are going to have a hard time choosing between the two of them. But if you look at, at Vegas, who do you take? You know, do you take a goaltender? Well, they started with Brassois. You probably can't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Eichel had a tremendous I, second I, round. That's who I would have gone with. But, you know, his third round was just okay, yeah. right? His yeah. third round was just okay. Carlson yeah. has 10 goals, yeah. and he checked the heck out of Mc, McDavid. So he's giving it to you offensively, and 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 he's also, you know, checking the you know the the, the key guy on, on, on the other team. So... So, you know, to me, William Carlson and the fourth line are the factors in, in Vegas. And I picked Vegas in seven. I, to, and I have no reason to, that's both guests have picked Vegas. Uh, I, the only thing that I think uh, when I think of uh, Florida outside of Bobrovsky, yeah. are we watching Matthew Kachuk turn into a superstar? Are we seeing that supernova, not coming out party because he scored 100 plus points last year, yeah. but... He went in and ran Boston's show at the end of that, right? He has, you know, what he did against Carolina when it mattered. I just, I just wonder if we're watching something in front of our own eyes. Yeah, and, and I, I don't have a good answer for that because I don't know. Like I was asked on a radio show or podcast uh, uh, Albert, rec yeah. recently about, you know, the Kachuk's breakout year. And I, and, and I said, no, the breakout year was two years ago. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, like if, if you were paying attention, he was the eighth leading scorer in the league two years ago. And he was one third of the top line in hockey with Johnny Gaudreau and, and Elias Lindholm. Yeah. So to, to imply that this started from the moment he arrived in Florida is incorrect. I think the maturing of, of Matthew Kachuk started two years ago. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, made the point i think that you know when he was a young player coming in there was a real level of immaturity there a, a level of yep. immaturity you see with you know players like trevor zegers right now in anaheim and and that often happens and 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 you can either continue to be immature throughout your entire career or you can learn from the experiences that you have along the way and i think that that's what happened with matthew kachuk i think he became a better teammate i think uh his teammates didn't have to fight his own his battles as as often as time went on and i think he became an important part of the leadership group which i don't think he was in in the in in the beginning so so what you're seeing is a gradual process with with matthew kachuk and you know, as you suggested, he's that's now two years as a mm -hmm. top ten scorer in the National Hockey League. So, so I, I would I would suggest he's already there. The one thing that people always use, a term that people always used to describe him was he was a unicorn, and I'm not sure that I I really bought that. But but then when you look at the way he has managed to raise his level at the precise 
time when you want someone to raise his level and he's done it con so consistently in these playoffs that you know like now i'm i'm starting to come on board with the fact that yeah he probably is a unicorn and he is you know unlike anyone else in the game so Connor mcdavid is still the best player you know i think leon dreisaitl is the second best player and then i love nathan mckinnon and kale mccarr so those you know like if, if you do that exercise you know who do you start your franchise with you know i'm taking those four ahead of matthew kachuk but then after that it gets interesting, right? You know, Austin Matthews, great goal scorer, but, oh, yeah. you know, the things that Kachuk brings to the mix, you know, he checks a lot of boxes. I, I don't know. But, but yeah, he's, you know, he, he's had an, a, an incredible run. I also think that if, if it comes up short and Vegas ends up winning over time and, and in the world we live in right now, it will happen very quickly. Teams almost always forget about those, you know, those great runner up finishes. And I'll go back oh. to a point that I, I made right is at the start of our conversation, you know, Nashville, well, that was an unbelievable run in 2017, you know, as the 16th seat, but when they didn't get it done, you know, you know, they kind of went backwards. Right. And then Montreal 2020 16th seed got to the final. Everyone's very excited about the future and they go backwards. So, so why does 2004 still resonate here? Well, because it hasn't happened since then, you know, and plus I think a lot of, but does 2017 resonate in Nashville the same way? Oh, it probably does in that community, but, but, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, like, yes, yes. You yeah, know, yeah. 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 You yeah, walk yeah. in the hockey hall of fame, there's the Stanley cup 2023. If it says Vegas there and not Florida, then, you know, it'll be like, was, was that the year that Florida was in the final? Agreed. Or, you know, Absolutely. Agree. Yeah, like yeah. It, yeah. Even, no, even people that pay real close attention to this, I, I mean, I have to look it up all the time to make sure I don't get my 2018 finalists confused with my 2019 finalists. Who did Anaheim yeah. be? Yeah. Right. A lot of people probably don't remember. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. it, um, it uh, I, I think that he's taken three of the four necessary steps to solidify himself in the in the yeah. at the level that you suggest. But but I also think that if they don't take this fourth step, that you know uh, you know it'll be back to square one in uh, in September's training camp, and then the season will start, and they they'll have a good team. But Tampa will have a good team, and Boston will have a good team, and Toronto will have a good team, and Ottawa's getting better, and Buffalo's getting better i mean if you look at detroit uh, yeah detroit uh, you know not quite at that level yet but still there i mean that's that's the best division in hockey already and it's just going to get better because because a couple of those young teams i think are ready to to take the next step so you know they barely made the playoffs this year i mean i think about when carolina won the cup you know in 2006 Six. Yeah, yeah and then the next year where were they right who was yeah. the starting goalie for carolina in 2006 in the start of the playoffs right? at the start was martin gerber and cam ward won it for them you know yeah. so they're you know that, that was when well that, that's how unexpected it was, exactly because right? yeah. that's a rookie too sure exactly i love yeah. it so anyway um <laughs> this is not a question i'm not even sure i i'm just gonna say it and then you can react um how crazy is it when you and I started doing this, we felt like, I felt like you and I were the only two adults in the room talking about Gary's Southern teams and Nashville and Florida. And now he's forcing it in Vegas and Florida. Yeah. And it doesn't even feel odd yeah. to me 20 years later. Yeah. Does it? No, no, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, you know, so you're talking about the vision of the National Hockey League and the footprint Sun of Gary Bell and all of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and 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 that was done, I think, largely for television purposes. Sure I think that you know when when Gary Batman took over, what 30 years ago now, I guess. Um, you know, his broader vision for the National Hockey League was to was to get national television contracts back when those meant something, when when television wasn't as split and diversified as it is today. And uh, and he felt that the only way to do that was to was to grow the hockey audience in non-traditional markets. And he's done that. Now, having said that, uh, you know, the Florida building is full now. Now. But, but you know, that's not a great location. Anyone that's ever been out to Sunrise, you know, the, the, you know. Just, nice it, it, mall. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't a great location. And, and, and you know, let's check back on, uh, you know, the Tuesday in the middle of November to see, you know, how many people are, are in the seats. That happens in, in Carolina. Um, Nashville, for whatever reason, has has just, you know, has just got it, you awesome. know, T Tampa as well. So so there's nothing wrong with the vision. But I also think that it, it 
it reflects um, a little bit about you know how the modern day player feels about uh, about the National Hockey League. There was a time when the, the lure of playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs, mm-hmm. the Montreal Canadiens, the Boston Bruins, the Chicago Blackhawks, sure. the original six teams that that mattered something. I don't know that it matters as much anymore. Like a young player will pay lip service to the fact that he was drafted by an original six team, but it doesn't feel like they're saying it with any conviction. During their lifetimes, the National Hockey League has been somewhere, somewhere between a 24 and a 32 team entity. And so, you know, um, you know, when I started, it was six teams. Those six teams matter to me. You know, now, you know, if you play for one of those six teams, you're going to face extra scrutiny from the media. There's going to be more pressure from the fans. And if you have a chance to play in Florida or in Vegas, you know, you go about your business, you're popular. And then when you go home, you, you have your privacy and, and, and your life. And I think that more and more players coming into the league value that. And it makes it increasingly difficult to to play in the markets, you know, like that we're reporting from today. And, you know, and we were talking about earlier it's, in the show, Toronto. And so, you know, I mean, Matthew Kachuk never articulated exactly why he wanted out of Calgary and, and why he wanted to go to Florida other than, I guess he gave an interview saying that Sam Bennett showed him around. It was like, Hey, this looks like a pretty good place, but part of the attraction is, you know, you, it's Florida, right? You know, yep. Keith can go down there in the winter and, uh, you know, and have his flip flops on and play golf. around a golf. And it, it's just, it, you know, it's a healthier life. I think about Phoenix, you know, all those years when Dave Tippett was running the team and Dave King was there and Bradshaw Living was an assistant general manager. Don Maloney was, was the GM. They, they had something to, to sell there. You know, you go to the rink, you know, and you leave and you, you know, you're wearing your flip flops, you know, Bill Armstrong. I, I talked to Bill Armstrong a couple of, he's the current general mm-hmm. manager in Coyotes. I talked to him several times this year and, um, one of the things that he said was that, you know, not everybody necessarily would want to play in this market, but we have a lot to offer. He talked about taxes. He talked about climate. He talked about, you know, the potential at that time, of course, of a, of a new arena, yeah, which yeah. seems to be, you know, uh, on hold at, at the moment. But but it's a pretty compelling case. And I almost felt like he was using my column as a, as a sales pitch for yeah, <laughs> players in yeah. the National Hockey League because it was like, come in and, and look us over and, and you'll see it's not too bad, you know. And uh, and I think that, that that is absolutely true. Well, you know what really resonates was the point you made about the original six because yeah. it used it used to be something. Yeah. Like your team is an original six. Like your team's an expansion team. Like yeah. I'm talking about the Flames and the Oilers and all of that. Yeah. And now that just seems like so distant, doesn't it? It does. It does to me. And again, I grew up in the. Yeah. I grew up in Toronto. You know, and yeah. when. You know, back before merchandising was as popular as it is, you had to go down to Doug Glory's Sporting Goods in the gardens. It's the only place you could buy a Leaf sweater. I got a, my Borea Salming sweater there. still have it in the closet uh, after all these years. And it meant something. It meant it was the Toronto Maple Leafs. And actually, that was something that Bradshaw Living said at the press conference. It's the Leafs. Yep. It's the Leafs. But he's a lifer. And and it matters, you know, to someone that has been around the game for as as long as he have. And I'm I'm not sure that it necessarily matters to everybody that's coming into the game today. Well, it matters to us out west too for the guys like me that watch Bugs Bunny and then Hockey Night Canada. One game, yeah. right? A sure. single game on Saturday night. That was it. Yeah. And it was Montreal or it was going to be Toronto. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just boy, we're old. Yeah. <laughs> it's changed a lot, hasn't it? <laughs> Let's not try to dwell on that. No, okay? <laughs> let's not dwell on that. Let's go to Vegas. Uh, thank you for this, sir. Um, I guess in a couple of weeks, we'll be halfway through this series the way it's straightened out. Yeah. But it's going to be a busy couple of weeks, I think. Yeah, exactly. And then on the 30th, which I guess is the second next time that I'm here, the draft will be over and free agency will be about to start. I know. So guess what? It'll be busy again. It will be busy It'll again. It'll be again busy still, All right? Thanks for coming in, buddy. Yeah, no problem. There you go. Eric Dehatchek. Joining us, of course, guests brought to you by Ski Seller Snowboard, skisellersnowboard.com, 76 years in Calgary. Join them right now uh, through the summer on McLeod Trail by Chinook Center, uh, but four locations in the winter. Don't forget, we are uh, just eight days away from UFC 289 in Vancouver. Nunez and Eldana um, right at Rogers Arena on June 10th. Uh, six Canadians are on this card Uh, And the co-main event, we'll see former lightweight champion and number one contender, Charles Oliveira. So it's a big card. UFC 289, Nunez and Aldano uh, uh, coming up. Aldana, I should say, coming up Saturday, June 10th. 
Just a couple of things before we send you away for the weekend uh, and a couple of community things. Let's start with soccer. I love this. I want to tip my hat uh, to my friend uh, over at, at Soccer Calgary, all of them. Um, but how about this? Free Play Fridays. I saw this and jumped on it. They got a great sponsor. Um, Carlo Bruno, who is the executive director for Soccer Calgary. We've had many conversations. But Free Play, just on a Friday, just – Send your kids to Genesis. Let them goof around, kick the ball around. Uh, all you need to do is sign a waiver. You can go online and get it. It's it's so much fun. Uh, but I want to see more of this. I love this for kids. So congratulations, a tip of the hat to Calgary Minor Soccer for Free Play Friday. Uh, and finally, you know, I'm doing some work for uh, Parachutes for Pets, which is a great organization here in Calgary, which just announced their uh, Pet Advocacy Center, which will open in September. But what a cool little thing we've got going on this summer. So if you, your group, your business would like to build a doghouse, a cat tree or a rabbit hutch, we've got a competition. Uh, you can donate it and then we're going to promote them. And we'll pick some winners, but we're going to auction them off to help with the advocacy center. So if you want more information, go to parachutesforpets.com. Uh, rumor has it there's some really cool ones. This is where you can get creative. This is where you can build that kick house, uh, that kick ass dog house, or that kick ass uh, cat tree that you've been trying to build for years, all for a great cause. So check it out, Parachutes for Pets. Coming up on Monday, we will be joined by Brent Cron and Ryan Pike. Uh, thanks to our brand spanking new producer, RJ, and our, of course, our regular old guy, Jack, who's just getting older. Um, and our two guests, uh, Anthony Cox, who was unbelievable, and the, the legend, Eric DeHatchik. What a show. I loved every second of it. I hope you did. If you liked it, tell a friend. We will see you back here on Monday. This is Just a Game, everybody. you can join but I'm an old dog and there's new tricks and some of my opinions you just can't fix cause I'm an old man staring at the sky I'm a shape